Most of the Eastern systems have this fundamental belief that the root of all disease is in the digestive tract. A lot of the digestive issues that were considered to have mysterious origins, non-infectious origins, very commonly they're starting to realize that actually there is a chronic infectious component to that. I think it was about 40 years ago now, stomach ulcers were considered to be largely stress-induced, but it wasn't actually causative. And so there was, you know, a doctor who proved that. He, he took some H. pylori and consumed it. And then within a few days, he started to develop stomach ulcers. While issues in your intestines are can be extremely painful and problematic, they're rarely life-threatening whereas issues in your stomach can easily become life-threatening because that acid is so strong, it can burn a hole in your stomach, you get a bleeding ulcer, and that can kill you. Welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, the creator and founder of Feel Younger and Genetic Insights, Ewan Robinson. And today we are carrying on the discussion. This is part three of our episode on infections and chronic diseases. So in the first two parts, the first part we went into depth on a few of the backgrounds of infections, what they are, things like that. Part two, we went into more in discussing the certain types of infections one may get on certain areas of the body. And in this part three, we're delving deeper into how to address and resolve the chronic infections of your digestive system. So Elwyn, Please, I know we, we covered a lot in the first two episodes. Um, before we get into it, is there anything you want to add to our listeners? So, yeah, this all definitely made more sense if you've watched the previous episodes, but I think we should do a quick recap, not the whole episodes, but just of the fundamental approach. So, first of all, if you are generally low in vitality, if you're generally you know very high in stress, if you feel very toxic if you have quite you know noticeable nutritional deficiencies these are all factors that can prevent you being successful with the strategies that we're going to give you in this episode so general advice for generally being strong enough to deal with infections um, to resolve chronic infections is to increase your vitality how do you know how vital you are well a good um not Definitive, but a good measure of that is your temperature, your uh, basal temperature, which you can measure by putting a thermometer in your mouth or in your armpit. Um, you want that to be about 36.6 to 36.8, which is, um, I think it's 98 to 98.2, something like that, Fahrenheit, it, first thing in the morning when you first wake up. And after you've had a meal, say your breakfast or your lunch, probably more than your dinner, because after dinner, maybe you, you should be starting to cool down a bit again. Uh, but in the middle of the day, after a meal, you want your temperature to be about 37, which is 98.6. If that's not the case for you, or if, um, if it is, but it's inconsistent, if you're off by, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, something like that, it's not the end of the world, especially if you're a woman, that's actually completely normal because it does fluctuate a little bit. But if you're off by quite a lot, if you're, you know, uh, 97.5, you're, you're 36.5, something like that, that means that your metabolism are not at a level where you're going to be able to as easily deal with an infection. It may well be one of those root causes. Uh, there's a bit of controversy about that. I've already weighed in on that on whether it's a good thing to have a fast metabolism or not. But I don't think there's any controversy about whether it's a good thing to have a fast metabolism when you're talking about fighting an infection. That's the whole point. That's the whole reason why there's such a thing as a, you know, a temperature or a fever. The more that your body increases your basal temperature, the more that you are able to fight infections. That's why if you've got a really bad infection, acute infection, your body might raise your temperature a lot, right? It might raise it in, you know, 38, 39 or, or more, or in the case of, you know, 100, 102, whatever. Um, it does that because the higher your basal temperature, the more able you're, the more that you're able to successfully fight an infection by far. Like it goes up in massive orders of magnitude. So the difference between 36.5 and 37 or difference between 97.5 and 98.5 Something like that is like a, a 10 times increase in the effectiveness of the immune system. Something like that. It's a huge increase anyway. So um, that's really important. And so what is required for that? Well, to, to have the temperature be up consistently, uh, especially up after meals, because sometimes 
you, people can be running on stress, but that's least likely to uh, be the case right after a meal. So to keep that up, temperature up in general is the thyroid. And then to keep it stable, to stop it fluctuating wildly, that's more the domain of the adrenals. And so if you have an issue with either of those things, they have to be resolved first in many cases. Not necessarily for an acute infection, of course, because if you have an emergency type infection, your body just pulls out all the stops, gets the temperature up, and it deals with it. But what we're talking about here is chronic infections, things that you probably had for weeks, months, years, sometimes even decades that just haven't been resolved. So that's where this is super important. Also, reducing toxicity. Uh, the more toxicity you have, the more that your body is um, split in its resources. It's going to be trying to deal with that as well as deal with the toxic, uh, as well as deal with the infection. And of course, infections create toxicity in your system. So if you're already overloaded with other toxins, then that's going to make things even more difficult. Too. And uh, also make sure you do not have nutritional deficiencies. The most famous when it comes to the immune system probably these days are you know, vitamin D3 and zinc. But actually, every single essential nutrient, <laughs> as the name implies, is essential. And every single nutrient, if you have a suboptimal amount, then that can be a weakest link in the chain that stops your immune system from functioning as well as you want it to function. So that's a very quick recap. Um, now, in terms of strategy, I tend to focus on four different things. Uh, so hygiene. So that's like the, the manual cleansing process, maybe. Um, you know, for instance, a toothbrush would be an example of that when it comes to the mouth. Then there is what I call removal, which you, you could put in two phases, but it's generally about killing the organism um, and then also transporting it out of the body. Some things do both. Some things are more specialized for one or the other part of that. And of course, that's the only part that, you know, a doctor will tend to be focused on giving you an antibiotic or an antifungal or whatever. And you could say it is the most important part. It probably is, but there are other aspects to it as well, like the next one, which is the soothing and rebalancing. So as we talked about in much more detail in the previous episodes, most of the feeling bad that comes with an infection is actually the impact of your own immune system, not the organism itself. It's the, the inflammation, the swelling, the pain, all of that kind of stuff, uh, it, uh, it, even the mucus. All of that is related to your own immune system. And so these days, most of us are chronically, systemically inflamed to some degree. And so sometimes a chronic underlying infection is actually the cause of that or one of the causes. But anyway, once you resolve those chronic underlying infections, sometimes the immune system doesn't just immediately calm down. Sometimes it is still overactive. It's still in an inflammatory state. Um, you know, it may react more, react more still to allergens. It may react more still to toxins. And so to uh, soothe the system, or I think more commonly it's called rebalance the system, is very important. And then recolonize is uh, also a significantly important step when it comes to the digestive tract, really more than anything else that we've talked about so far. So we'll definitely be talking about that. And so the tools that I usually use are um, herbs, enzymes, binders, probiotics, peptides, minerals, amino acids, drugs, and various other compounds as well, which we'll talk about. Wonderful, Owen. I know that those those four parts that you just mentioned about the hygiene and the removal and the soothing and rebalancing and potentially the recolonizing, we'll get, you know, we have gone into detail as we've talked about the different areas and as we will as we move forward with the digestive tract. So this is really, really great. So I know the first place that we want to kick it off really with is the stomach and the esophagus. So are there different variations for the stomach and esophagus that we should be looking out for in terms of infections? That's a good question. I mean, Esophageal uh, infections are usually um, more in the realm of, you know, colds and flus and stuff like that. So I feel like we've already covered that when we talked about the uh, the, the lungs and the sinus and the ref respiratory tract. So when I'm talking about esophagus, I'm talking about more the impact that the stomach has on the esophagus, which is significant and often underestimated by people, including me, until I really learned about it. So... Just before I get into that, I just want to talk about the importance of the digestive tract in general. I know everyone talks about this, so I won't spend too long on it, but just to kind of emphasize that most of the Eastern systems, um, 
like, for instance, the TCM system, which I'm very familiar with, and the Ayurvedic system, which I'm pretty familiar with. Um, these are the kind of most ancient systems of medicine that are still currently practiced anyway. And one of the things that they have in common is that they both have this fundamental belief that the root, and from their perspective, of all disease is in the uh, digestive tract. Now, you know, I've pondered that whenever I hear such extreme statements, uh, I tend to question them because there's always exceptions to things. And I think that there are exceptions to that, especially these days. But I kind of see what they mean. So when I say especially these days, I mean, uh, you know, breathing in toxicity, for instance, is significant. Um, contact to toxicity through the skin is significant. Uh, radiation toxicity is significant. So there are various things these days, certainly, that make us ill that are not digestive tract related really at all, other than that the digestive tract is also damaged by that stuff. But I'm thinking more of like how things were up until recently. And I think up until recently, um, it probably was an issue of the digestive tract a lot of the time that would actually maybe take you out, but probably more likely be a factor that would weaken you or um, inflame you going in the other direction. Or, you know, we talked about the importance of nutrients, for instance, a chronic infection as well as an acute infection in the digestive tract can prevent you absorbing nutrients properly. Then you have nutritional deficiencies, then that can have all kinds of other issues, which you know we've talked about in different episodes. Um, in terms of absorbing toxins, yes, you know, people have always breathed in toxins, especially, you know, people used to have open fires indoors, for instance, and be breathing a lot of smoke in some parts of the world they still do. So I realize, you know, there's other ways that toxins come in, but still, a lot of toxins come in through the digestive tract. We should have the ability to largely deal with that and screen them out. But ironically, when we have this dysfunction in our digestive tract and, you know, chronic infections is possibly the biggest source of that, we have more of a tendency to this thing called intestinal permeability or what they call leaky gut, which basically is where suddenly the, the, the for want of a better word, the holes <laughs> that uh, are, are supposed to only allow in the smallest particles, so individual amino acids, individual lipids, um, suddenly become bigger and bigger particles can get through. So significantly more toxins can start coming in through the digestive tract. So that's another potential impact. So your essential nutrients can go down when you have chronic infections in the digestive tract. Your uh, toxins can go up. A lot of hormones are uh, created in the digestive tract. We've talked about T3 before, the active thyroid hormone, how important it is. So most of the T3 that's created is actually created uh, in your digestive tract, um, the conversion of T4 to T3. Certainly, if you include the liver as part of the digestive tract, which we will do for this conversation, then absolutely, definitely, it's the vast majority <laughs> of that conversion. And so that's one example. You know, people talk a lot about the neurotransmitters, like um, the vast majority of serotonin is created in the digestive tract. Although that's not necessarily the serotonin that goes into the brain, it still can get into the bloodstream, especially if you have that leaky gut and that can still massively affect you. Um, dopamine, GABA, acetylcholine, histamine, um, there's probably more like forgetting, but all of these are neurotransmitters that profoundly affect how you feel. All of those are created in the gut. But more importantly, all of those are created in the gut by microorganisms. So if you have one microorganism profile, you might be creating 10 times as much, um, oh yeah, that's another one, noradrenaline or norepinephrine than another person. And then you're wondering why you have anxiety all the time that you can't seem to resolve. You know, another person uh, may be producing, yeah, way more serotonin and they're wondering why they're feeling, you know, emotionally disassociated all the time. Uh, or maybe, you know, depressed, feeling depressed and helpless and stuff like that. That can also be an impact. Uh, you know, another person might be creating loads of, uh, might have organisms that are creating a huge amount of histamine and then they want, might wonder why they're reacting to things way more like having allergic intolerant sensitivity type reactions to things so that's just a few examples um, of how how you feel is profoundly impacted by the state of your digestive system then as you've probably again heard experts say because it's quite common these days um, the majority of your immune system is contained in your digestive system because it is such an important job 
to uh, screen what is coming through and to stop the mainly toxins, but also, uh, you know, in an emergency situation, the microorganisms themselves from coming through. And so th when that, when the immune system is struggling to deal with that, then that affects how the immune system can deal with everything else that can easily push it over the edge from a balanced state to an inflammatory state, which can have systemic problems throughout the whole system. I could probably go on. I but you get... say, yeah, they, so the, I mean, like, what was it? I can't remember who said it, but let food be thy medicine. I mean, that is one of the biggest things. The digestive tract is responsible for so much that's going on in our system. Like you just said, it's, you know, the, whether we're able to receive the nutrition that we need for this body to function optimally or not, or, you know, there's so much going on that, um, that one, Many of us may not even be aware that how our digestive system is operating is even suboptimal. It just, people may think, oh, that's just how it is, or that's just what happens when you age. But they may not understand, actually, there's other underlying things that are going on that that's not how it's supposed to be. Absolutely right. Yeah. And so going back to those ancient systems, so, you know, in Ayurveda, they say that ama, which they, is usually... Um, translated is toxicity in the digestive tract. It's like the root of all disease. But I'd say, first of all, that translation comes from a system that, remember, microorganisms, as we talked about in part one of this, were only discovered 150 years ago. So uh, when they say it's toxicity, I don't think they're only talking about toxicity. I actually think they are absolutely talking about chronic infections. And, of course, the consequence of chronic infections, which one of them is toxicity, as we just talked about. Um, so I would say chronic infections in the digestive tract plus the outcome of that, which is just to sum up very quickly, lack of essential nutrients being, being able to be absorbed, excess of toxins being able to be absorbed, and then, um, excess of unhelpful nervous system modulating agents being absorbed. So, for instance, stress. We all know stress is bad for us. Well, if you have 10, 20, 30 times as much noradrenaline as should be being created being created in your intestines right now because of the microorganism profile, and then you have leaky gut, so a lot of it is getting into the bloodstream, uh, that's going to have a huge impact on how you feel. If your stress goes up, your thyroid you know, activity goes down, your, it affects your insulin negatively, all of that you know, knock-on consequence can all start with that. So... I, w I won't go on anymore, but just basically to emphasize uh, examples, I guess, of why it is so important to resolve those underlying chronic infections. And as we were just talking about before we started recording, Chrissy, I think that, and I think that other people are starting to realize that, this is not just my theory, that chronic infections in the digestive tract are actually way more common than we think. One of the things that is absolutely coming into focus, I think, in the kind of gastroenterologist world specifically, is that a lot of the digestive issues that were considered to have uh, mysterious origins or that were considered to have kind of non-infectious origins, IBD, um, uh, colitis, uh, all of that kind of stuff, diverticulitis, all that kind of stuff, even IBS, very commonly, they're starting to realize that actually there is a chronic infectious component to that. So it's not to say necessarily it isn't a nervous system problem or it's not an immune system problem, but to say if you actually genuinely resolve that chronic infection issue, which often, often isn't that easy, but if you do, then those other problems can then much more easily be resolved as well. And I'll give examples of that. But I'll, I'll just tell a story of an example of that, which is the most famous which is the whole uh, stomach ulcers thing, which leads, leads uh, nicely into what we were meant to be talking about <laughs> first. Uh, I think it was about 40 years ago now, up until that point, stomach ulcers were considered to be largely stress-induced, just like to this day, IBS is considered to be largely stress-induced. And the thinking behind that was not crazy. Um, it was basically... 
when people had a, a stress episode, often that's where they had an ulcer flare up and the ulcer started bleeding or, or whatever. And, and so there was that obvious connection, correlation made, but it wasn't actually causative. And so there was a, you know, a doctor who proved that um, he believed that it was caused by an infectious agent. This was re uh, ridiculed for a long time because human stomachs are very acidic. We are as acidic as, you know, the most predatory predator. Um, often it's like pH 1 or pH 2, which is extremely acidic. And so the general consensus was that uh, nothing can survive in there. No microorganisms can survive in such an acidic environment. And therefore, the root cause of stomach ulcers cannot be infections. It can't be because nothing could survive in there. Maybe it could make its way past there, which it does but nothing's actually going to make its home there, right? Does that make sense? Because it's so acidic there. And yet... Yeah, I, I understand it, but Mother Nature does have a way. <laughs> yeah, and so I think the story is quite famous of how he proved this. So uh, he actually, because no one would believe him, he, he took some H. pylori and consumed it, at least he swallowed it, and then within a few days, he started to develop stomach ulcers. And that's that's actually how he proved it. This is typical in the scientific world that, um, you know, you have to go to extreme lengths often to change a dominant paradigm. And so that's what he did. And so these days, stomach ulcers have gone from considering, you know, considered as a stress-caused uh, problem and considered quite difficult to treat to being considered as an infection cause problem in i've seen various estimates of this anything from 90 percent to 98 percent, depending on which website you're looking at which doctor you talk to or whatever but you know the vast majority um are based on an h pylori infection i actually think there's more organisms that have not been identified yet that it could be one thing i've not had a um, gastroenterologist answer for me yet is because ulcers are not only in the stomach they're also in the duodenum so the duodenum and in fact they're commonly in the duodenum and the duodenum is this uh winding tube that leads from the stomach past the gallbladder and pancreas uh, and then onwards ultimately to the um uh, jejunum which is the first part of the small intestine and so that the environment of the duodenum according to again you know, uh, Google search, whatever, is around pH 6. So that's an environment where plenty of different bacteria can thrive. So why is it that only H. pylori could possibly be the cause of an ulcer in the uh, in the duodenum? I haven't seen anyone explain that to me in satisfaction. I think it could be all kinds of different uh, organisms. If the organism can make it as far as the small intestine, which it certainly can, and we'll talk about that, then... You know, it's only one step up. It's one valve up <laughs> from there into the uh, into the duodenum. So anyway, infectious components as being you know a key, and so that was as I said, I think it's for around forty years ago. I believe that there will be, and there already are, in the process of being um, people saying that actually all these other digestive issues also are either caused by chronic infections. Or they are at least, you know, the chronic infection is at least a significant factor. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about the stomach. Yeah, so. definitely. Let's talk about the stomach. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, yeah, going back, um, you know, what are the potential? Are there different variations or is there just one culprit when it comes to the stomach? I think it is bacterial. Uh, I don't believe that it is fungal or uh, viral. Um, as I said, I don't believe it's only H. pylori uh, necessarily, but I don't have proof that it's not. Um, the reason why I do think it is only bacterial is because the antibiotics do either the doctor prescribed antibiotics or other herbal alternative antibiotics that we talked about. But basically, antimicrobial agents, antibacterial agents um, are usually very effective. So if it were, you know, frequently a fungus causing uh, these stomach issues, and that wouldn't be the case. So I'm pretty convinced that, you know, it is a bacterial issue. Now, to go back to that question you asked about the esophagus, why do I uh, class the esophagus along with the stomach? Well, because 
you know, before people have stomach ulcers bad enough to be diagnosed and dealt with, the symptoms that they usually have often are in the esophagus or even, you know, in the throat, in the mouth. And it even affects the sinuses, which you were asking me about in the last episode, and sometimes even the ear canal. So what happens is that if something goes wrong, and we'll talk about what goes wrong in a second, but if something goes wrong, then contents that should stay in the stomach comes up into the esophagus, into the throat, and even into the sinus, into the mouth, potentially even to the ear canal and causes problems. What kind of problems? So the contents of the stomach, as we just said earlier, is supposed to be extremely acidic. Two things that are mainly in there are hydrochloric acid and pepsin. So hydrochloric acid is an acid. It's extremely acidic. It's one of those things, if you pour it on something, it's probably going to burn it. You could easily burn a hole in it. It's a really strong acid. Your body has to do a lot of work, which we can get into if you want to, to kind of protect the lining of the stomach to stop that acid burning hole in the stomach because it is so strong. The other thing is a pepsin. So pepsin is a protein breaking down, protein uh, digesting agent, okay? And so what do you think happens if that, if that acid and that pepsin doesn't stay in the stomach, but actually comes back up into the esophagus and even higher. Well, acid will burn. So it will burn the esophagus. Is this the common where people are complaining of GERD or where GERD's coming into it, that, that that's yeah. coming back up? Yeah. So acid reflux is the more you know common form. It is extremely common. Um, Anti-acids, medication. Uh, medication, either literally just an alkali like carbon, calcium carbonate, stuff like that, uh, or uh, PPIs, which is a medication to stop your body making acid, or sometimes uh, H2 antagonists, which are kind of a little bit more indirect. They are blocking your body from making histamine, which then blocks your body from making acid because it's uh, the level of acid in your stomach is largely controlled by a level of histamine in the digestive tract. So all of those drugs are very common, very popular, um, often over the counter. You don't even need to uh, have a prescription for them. And so, yeah, they're some of the most commonly prescribed and also commonly used drugs, huge industry. And so if that acid comes up into the esophagus, it'll burn it. So yeah, acid reflux and then GERD stands for uh, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. So it's basically the same thing. It's just where you have reflux all the time. Um, and it, it's burning it. And there's different types of it as well. Um, there's something else called silent reflux, which uh, I found interesting. And so what is silent reflux? Silent reflux is where you don't have noticeable acid coming up. So you're not burping up um, you know, actual acid that's burning your throat. You're not burping up food residue, any of that kind of stuff. But you are burning. You, you have burning in your sinuses, you have burning in your mouth. And so where does that come from? My understanding, that's the pepsin. That's the other stuff. So as bad as it is to burn your throat, because it's literally like a burn, it's an acid burn, it's a chemical burn, but just as bad but kind of more subtle is having a powerful enzyme that breaks down protein in your whole digestive and upper respiratory tract because all of that is basically protein. <laughs> Flesh is largely protein. I mean, we may get into this when we get more into the large intestine, small intestine, but like, could that be creating pockets? If you're like, it, it, like lower down in the large intestine, we have things like diverticulitis. Would that be the acids going through and like eating that? Or is that something different? That's more something different. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The problem is when it comes up. Yeah. Yeah. I just if, didn't know if it would be, if it come when it comes up and that acid is potentially burning away at the protein, if it's creating little pockets, if it's creating things like that, like what would the, or is it just eating it yeah, away? Yeah, it can do, but I th sorry, okay. I thought you were talking about the small intestine. No, I was just saying, because diverticulitis, uh, there's a lot of people that get diagnosed with that, this large intestine, you really hear about it in that area. So don't really hear much about up top <laughs> in that way. So I was just wondering, because I have somebody I do know does have like, a, she has a pocket up in her throat that where food, when it's when she's trying to chew it, or it will get caught and she just has to cough, cough, cough to try and get it out. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a specific medical condition, but I, I wouldn't be surprised 
um, if that caused it, but there might be something else going on there. Um, but yeah, that it could be the case. It could be that uh, it's been worn away by a combination of acid and protein digesters, and for whatever reason, it's localized in a specific area, and then stuff starts getting caught there. Absolutely, right. yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely possible. Um, so that's how it can also affect the sinuses. Like the acid doesn't usually get up into the sinuses unless you're, you know, having the reflux and then kind of sneezing, like sometimes if you vomit, like that kind of stuff. I mean, I've done that before. But oh, yeah, not fun. <laughs> I, I, that does happen to some people, unfortunately. Like some people have reflux and it happens to them in their sleep and, you know, and it is a regular occurrence. Um, but that doesn't have to happen to you for your digestive tract to affect your sinuses, which is what you were asking about in the last episode. All that happens is, uh, all that needs to happen is for this gas to come up from the stomach because there's also fermentation going on there of things that are not optimal and then all this all that needs to be case is that this gas contains pepsin and then that can start burning or starting to digest the whole area now we talked about what the stomach does to protect itself from that acid um and so one of the you know the primary barrier is this layer of mucus and so what happens when this acid and or protein digester pepsin comes up into the esophagus and even into the upper respiratory area, your body produces mucus to protect itself. It's the same thing. And so when you talked about earlier, why would colonics help with uh, sinusitis? Uh, I believe this is really the answer. I've never had a good answer ever from a medical professional. It's something that they just dismiss. But my understanding of it is that um, if you can stop that reflux from occurring the silent reflux that you might, might not actually notice you might not actually be having any you know burping up acid or any of that kind of stuff but you're you're having gas come up and it's irritating the whole system and that's what's causing it um so we'll talk about you know colonics and stuff later that's large intestine and small intestine but yeah that's that's how it could be related to answer your question from the last episode no that makes sense it makes sense yeah, I think we'll get into how do we deal with it. Yeah, so I was going to ask because, I mean, well, just going back into it, and I'm sure it's probably on your list. I remember from our episode on peptides, one of the ones you discussed was um, BP-157. So I'm assuming that one's going to be in here to help <laughs> help help heal it. <laughs> it is in the list, yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's take them in order. I don't have a huge list for this one. Oh, actually... Before we do that, I think the other thing we should just address is those antiacids that we talked about. Right. Because I do. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because that's just a Band-Aid, really, essentially. Correct? I mean, people really need to look at the underlying issue. Yeah. And that's something I think even acknowledged in the medical profession since, you know, that discovery of H. pylori in the 80s, that it is ultimately a Band-Aid. Now, it kind of depends a little bit. If your primary issue is an ulcer, then it is not only a Band-Aid. It... <sighs> It is either a Band-Aid or a therapeutic tool, depending on what you're using it with. So, because the truth is, all right, let's get into this. Because everyone in the mainstream medical world says the, the, the problem, the thing that causes reflux and all the rest of it is an excess of acid. That's why antiacids are good. But everyone in the alternative health world, functional medicine, natural medicine, all the rest of it, they tend to say the opposite. They say that the causes low stomach acid. Now, they have to do a little bit of, uh, and I'm not saying they're wrong, but there has to be a little bit of mental gymnastics to justify this. If I'm having acid come up and burning me, and then I take antiacids and it makes me feel better, how could that be? The problem is low acid, right? It doesn't make much sense intuitively, but this is the explanation they give. And again, I'm not saying they're wrong. Um, I'll give my commentary on it afterwards. But the explanation is this. None of this stuff should be coming up because you have this series of valves or otherwise known as sphincters you actually have a bunch of sphincters you have one here um, around the throat you have one between the bottom of the esophagus and the stomach you have one between uh, the stomach and the duodenum you have several around the um where the gallbladder releases into the duodenum where the pancreas releases into the duodenum they're called sphincter of Odi, and that's where I had this pain condition for years. I had what's called sphincter of Odi dysfunction, um, where those valves don't work properly, and then that can be extremely painful and problematic. Um, and then you also have a valve um, 
between the duodenum and the small intestine, and then you have a valve between the small intestine and the large intestine, and then you have a valve between the large intestine and the outside world. So you have all of these valves, and each valve is meant to be going one way. It's to stop things going backwards. You do in, in none of in every single I listed them all for a reason. In every single case that I just said, you do not want it going the other way. You do not want it going back. Uh, you know, from your esophagus back into your mouth. You do not want it going back from the stomach into the esophagus. You don't want it going back from the duodenum into the stomach, you know, etc. I won't go through the whole list again. But <laughs> basically, you do not want it going backwards. Now, there is an issue there with with sphincters where they can become dysfunctional. And I, again, I only learned about this because I have quite a rare version of this. Um, the, the, what's called the sphincter of Odi or Odi. Yeah, I've never heard around, of that before. So that's the one around the gallbladder area. Um, but the much more common one that people may be aware of and much more commonly have an issue with is that one between the stomach and the esophagus, that that sphincter is not closing properly. Because if you think about it, no matter how bad it contents of the stomach is, if that sphincter works correctly, then none of it would go back into the esophagus, and yet it does. So what the people say who say the problem is usually low stomach acid is that it takes a certain level of acidity to exist in the stomach for that sphincter to close. Right. And so that is where they often have success giving people more stomach acid and more peptin. So there's a, you know, a supplement called betaine hydrochloride, which pretty much always includes peptin. And I think, you know, from what I've heard, something like two to 3,000 milligrams of that with a meal is often effective at both helping the person improve their digestion, but also actually preventing that reflux. Um, so that's their perspective. I, from my experience, it isn't true 90% of the time that the cause is low stomach acid, but it might still be true, I don't know, 60, 70% of the time. It's, it's certainly true a lot more than the medical establishment um, I'm generally aware of. So that go back to your original question, aren't antiacids just a, um, a Band-Aid? So in that sense, they are, because you don't have an excess of acidity if that's your situation. You actually have a lack of acidity. And so putting an alkali on top of it especially is um, obviously not resolving the situation. And taking something that blocks your body producing acid, it could resolve the symptoms because if you've already got low acid and then you take a PPI, then you're going to go from low acid to almost no acid, and then you're not going to have an issue of reflux. But then you're also not going to be able to digest your food properly, unfortunately. That's a good point, because I did want to uh, say... A and, and sorry, other than not digesting your food properly, the stomach acid is supposed to be the main barrier to stop the organisms getting in, which is the chronic infection issue. So, yeah. No, because there is, I mean, there are um, a lot of alkaline waters out there. What does that pose, potentially? Uh, that's a good question. So I went through a big phase of those. I think in certain situations, they are worth taking. Um, you know, there are examples of people with kidney disease, for instance, where it's beneficial and that I think are medically acknowledged. And then there's various other situations where it may potentially be helpful, more anecdotally. But there are problems with it. So number one is the one we just said, that if it's a strong alkali, like pH 10, which some of these drinks are, some of these waters are, that is going to reduce even more the acidity of the stomach environment. So if you are going to do those things, uh, either alkaline water or adding alkalizing agents to water or whatever, the recommendation is always away from food. So do not put it in your stomach when your stomach still has food in it because that's going to completely mess up the, uh, the process. And um, do not drink it, say, a minute before you eat because you're going <laughs> to dilute the acid in there that now half an hour before a meal an hour before a meal something like that or you know just before bed many hours after a meal like that's less likely to be an issue it could create a different problem though which is that uh generally the more acidic the intestines are the less the pathogenic organisms proliferate so that's the other issue that's a general rule it's not 100 percent um, there are exceptions, just like there are some organisms that thrive in acid. We've listed one, H. pylori. There are some organisms that thrive in even bile, even though that's another thing that's supposed to kill organisms. That there are, uh, There's a, an organism called 
uh, bilophilia wadsworthia, for instance, that bilophilia means, literally means bile lover. It just eats bile. Um, so, you know, and there are some organisms that will thrive in an alkaline environment. I can't remember the name of them off the top of my head. But yeah, there's always exceptions. Sorry, in an acidic environment that, that are bad. There's always exceptions. But generally, you don't want an alkaline environment in the intestines. So that's the other potential problem with uh, over-alkalizing um, the digestive tract. Yes, it may be good for your kidneys. It may be good for this, may be good for that, maybe in certain situations. But it usually is not doing the uh, digestive environment any favors. Um, and it is doing it favors it's because something is going wrong with the pancreas but we'll talk about that a little bit later um, so back to the um, stomach so it's not really a chronic infection advice but it's something to investigate is how much stomach acid am i producing this is relevant to the infections in the sense as, as i just mentioned the stomach acid is supposed to be the main barrier to stop to kill any infections other than h pylori maybe a couple of other things that haven't been discovered yet but almost everything is supposed to kill it to stop it getting to the intestine. And yet, um, and so knowing if you have low stomach acid is important for that. Is so, there a test for that that you that we know of? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a difficult one and then an easy one. The practitioners I've seen, even I've got an MD who's had me do this test before. So this is, you know... Uh, not a spurious one. This is not like, oh, I won't insult anyone, but it's not like some of the most spurious tests out there, but it's not super, super scientific either. Um, it's one that you can do at home. Get First thing in the morning when you wake up, before you drink, eat, do anything, get yourself a glass of water, medium size, and put half a teaspoon of baking soda in there, which is a pure alkali. And just a regular water, not an alkaline water from a certain machine that's sitting out a pH or anything like that. Just a regular water. Doesn't matter hugely because half a teaspoon of baking soda will so massively track okay. the pH anyway. But sure, pH seven. If you want to be completely, um, what's the word? <laughs> not skew, not skew the uh, results at all. Yes, um, and then you add uh, so half a teaspoon of baking soda and get yourself a stopwatch. The one on your phone is fine. And drink it. Try and drink it in one gulp. That's why I say not a huge glass of water. Drink it in one go and start your stopwatch the second you put down your glass again and then what you're waiting for is to see how long it takes you to burp if you burp in a few seconds could be because you just genuinely have some fermentation in your digestive tract so we don't count that unless it's very considerable so generally you'll start burping uh between three to five minutes the longer it takes you to burp the lo after the three minute mark the more sign it is that you have low stomach acid okay so if you're burping at three minutes pretty much exactly you probably got a perfect amount of stomach acid if it's 330 it might be a little bit low if it's four it's quite low if it's 430 it's pretty low if it's five it's you know low and if it's any more than that or if you don't burp at all then it's quite possibly very low so that's the at home test if there was some blood test or something, I might not even mention that, but there isn't. The only other option is to go to a gastroenterologist and um, do a uh, endoscopy, which is very unpleasant and expensive. Or these days they do have other technology, like they can they literally put a little capsule with like a camera and a sensor on it on a string and put it down there and then kind of pull it back up again. And um, but yeah, all expensive. Time-consuming, unpleasant, takes a long time to get a referral. I'm not saying not to do it, but I'm just saying it's not the first port of call. Obviously, if you have an ulcer or suspected or whatever, you need to do whatever the doctor tells you. But I'm saying this is not something to volunteer for if they are not telling you you need it, <laughs> if you can avoid it uh, in most cases, because you can just do that test. So if you do have low stomach acid, it's not going to resolve any chronic infection. But it's worth knowing because it will prevent. And I did say at the beginning when I talk about pre preventing and resolving. So what you do then is you get yourself some betaine hydrochloride, very commonly available supplement, usually contains, as I say, well, pretty much always contains pepsin as well because those two tend to come together. And then you have those with a meal. When I say with, don't have it before because too much acid can burn your stomach, Right. So, and you, you don't want to increase it too quickly either. So normally you have like one of those capsules halfway through a meal, not the beginning of the meal. So it's all, you're putting it on top of a bunch of food and then 
uh, you at least spend a couple of days of that. If you feel nothing or better, then you have another one, and usually up to like five or six of these capsules per meal, which is a lot. But often that's what it takes for people for it to actually be uh, effective. Um, the idea of that is not that you need it forever. The idea of that is that probably the reason you've got low stomach acid in the first place is because you're missing some kind of essential nutrient. And you may be missing that central nutrient because you're not absorbing food properly and you may not be absorbing food properly because you don't have stomach acid. So it's, it's a bit that of a vicious circle. circle. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you supplement the beta and HCL temporarily, usually a few months, the idea being that then you can absorb nutrients again, probably especially amino acids, but also some minerals, um, until you get your stomach acid up naturally to where you want it to be. So there's a big diversion on that, but it's an important topic it's a very, on uh, prevention. Yeah, it's really, really important to have that awareness, have that understanding, because many people might not even know, or just like, oh, that's it, that's just what I have for the rest of my life. But not knowing there's a knock-on effect or that it can be you know, potentially reversed. Yes. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality, affordable supplements that Elwin and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers, but the prices are very affordable. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're really helpful and friendly. And what I love most of all is the amazing descriptions Elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it. I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have for most articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code rejuvenateme for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code rejuvenateme at feelyounger.net. So the other thing that's often recommended along with that is stuff to soothe the stomach. And I'm going to get to that. But let's just talk about quickly about dealing with that infection first. Let's go back to the order I was originally saying. Um, there isn't really a hygiene step for the stomach. Uh, there's no way to kind of flush it out. Ah, no way. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> some people do, you know, like salt water flushes. Um, we drink, you know, several liters of strong salt water. That kind of flushes it out. Uh, to some degree, doing an enema on a clinic, which we'll talk about later, does flush it out because by draining the bottom of a complex system, everything else kind of drains down. So, uh, but yeah, there isn't really a flushing system. That, that's not one that I'd recommend anyway. Um, so then we go to the remove step, right? So probably the best thing for H. pylori, very effective, is mastic gum. Mastic gum is... Um, found on this tree in a Greek island. It's um, it's a fruit of a tree. Uh, but, well, a fruit. I mean, it's literally a gum from a tree. It um, was very rare until recently. It's recommended really for two purposes. It's either recommended for this, or it's recommended because it's kind of a much harder to chew gum. And so a lot of people also recommend it, like chewing it for a long time to strengthen the jaw. So that's the other benefit of it, if you want a stronger jaw. Um, it tastes fairly innocuous, I would say. Uh, it tastes okay. But yeah, the general consensus is that often it is as effective or even more effective than the uh, pharmaceutical antimicrobials. So given that it's cheap, available over the counter, safe, all the rest of it, if you're not dealing with an emergency, um, then it may be something you want to consider trying first. And if it doesn't work, then going to, you know, maybe a more pharmaceutical route. Another thing that I would also classify with soothe, but it, it has some antimicrobial action, so I'll mention it now, would be aloe vera. I know we've uh, just done an episode about all the benefits of that, so I won't go into that in much more detail. Something else that I've come across that I think is uh, very beneficial in this regard that shows, uh, you know, good studies around it as well, is something called pylopes. Um which um, is like a brand name for a specific strain of bacteria which has been inactivated, or in other words, killed. Um, I think it's El Rutori DSM17458, something like that. It's um, Anyway, I think if you Google Pylopass, you'll find it, P-Y-L-O pass, uh, you'll find it via that. So that is a very we talked uh, in the previous episode about how all these microorganisms are always involved in chemical warfare against each other. So they just happen to have found that this particular bacteria 
creates this particular chemical warfare agent that is actually very effective against um, against Ace Pylori. And so that would be another thing that I would personally try. Again, if there was no emergency, if I wasn't in pain or anything like that, but I suspected that there's an infection, then that would be another thing that you could consider before you go the pharmaceutical route. There are other things, but those are the only two that I've come across that I have seen sufficient evidence for and really strong um, anecdotal testimonials for as well. So those are the two that I would be inclined to recommend. If they don't do it, I would probably go down the um, the uh, prescribed route next. But they're both uh, very interesting, I would say, very good. And I've had like I had one doctor recently tell me that you know they recommend mastic first, not just because it's less side effects, but they actually find it more effective. There's like a thing about how mastic is off uh sorry how um h pylori is quite resistant sometimes to antibiotics which is why they actually often give two three i think sometimes even four uh well no types of oh types type, oh yeah types right 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 yes at once and then yeah as you say often it could be for a long time i mean most antibiotics are like a week whereas i think it's usually four to six weeks that they'll do a course so it's a lot of antibiotics for a long time so if you need that then do it it's way better than a stomach ulcer especially a bleeding one but if you don't need it and you know no one's prescribing you anything then starting with some mastic mastic gum and pylopass i would say are a uh, really good option and then we'll go to soothing so soothing is something that you want to do both if, if you have an infection but also if you have this low stomach acid because there is part of the problem that um your body may have got used to the level of stomach acid you have. And so if you're increasing that acid quickly by supplementing it, then uh, that could irritate the lining of everything. So you want, so as I said, it's, um, it's mainly this mucus barrier that your body uses. And so you actually want to take things that promote and increase that mucus barrier if you're in either of those two situations. That makes absolute sense because it's like trying to get into a very, very, very hot bath. It's going to be like, ooh, but if you get in and you warm it as you go, which then if you're reintroducing the stomach acid, then the body has time to build up that mucus membrane again to help coat and to do all of those things, then that makes sense. Yes. Now, I'll just mention that one of the things that's essential for having an adequate level of that barrier are these things called prostaglandins. And most people, if they've heard of prostaglandins, it's because they're bad. They are inflammatory, right? And so the drugs that are most effective at lowering them are the NSAIDs like paracetamol and ibuprofen. And this is why, other than H. pylori, the other thing that's usually blamed for stomach ulcers is those drugs because they lower prostaglandins now some people in our alternative health community really just follow us a rapey i'll just say it you know are big fans of aspirin um and taking large amounts sometimes they even take several grams a day i won't deny that large amounts of aspirin can have significant beneficial effects especially as long as you know what you're doing and you're taking the stuff that you need to to go with it but i would suggest that everything i'm about to say is in that category of stuff you should take with it like if you are lowering prostaglandins systemically i would take at least some of the stuff i'm about to say as well to support the uh, mucus barrier in the stomach specifically now there were you know i've heard plenty of people anecdotally say oh i, I take whatever it is x grams of aspirin a day i've never had an issue in my stomach that's fine fair enough right but if you do, if you're watching this, maybe you have had an issue with your stomach or you do right now, then you want to be really careful of those things and you want to support that soothing. So, recommended. My favorite is called DGL, which stands for uh, deglycerated licorice. Um, D, uh, so the glycerin is the kind of, it's kind of the active component of licorice in the sense that it's what gives it its hot quality from a kind of energetic Chinese medicine point of view. Um, but it raises cortisol, basically. It raises, and it can raise blood pressure, all that kind of increasing fire from that Eastern perspective. So that's not helping a person who wants to soothe their stomach. So they take that uh, glycerin out. And that means that you can take, you can take a lot of DGL, whereas you have to be careful taking, you know, 
licorice beyond a certain level is going to cause real problems if it's not deglycerated. So deglycerated licorice, uh, you can buy it in capsules or powder. If you take it in capsules, it's recommended to actually open the capsule and put it in your mouth or put it in water because you want it to coat. I mean, it'll reach your stomach anyway, but most people who have this issue also have irritated esophaguses, right? So it will also soothe your esophagus if you do that. Same with aloe vera. If you have aloe vera in a capsule, now, I would recommend aloe vera, you know, juice or obviously fresh or uh, whatever so that it's contacting your esophagus on the way down. I wouldn't keep it in a capsule, personally. And glutamine is something that is more generally recommended to soothe the intestinal tract, but it also has a role in soothing the uh, stomach so i'll mention it quickly here uh there's something called zinc carnosine uh so zinc is a mineral carnosine is an amino acid the combination of the two again soothes the whole intestinal tract but also has been shown to soothe the um the stomach and then yes as you mentioned earlier chrissy <laughs> bpc 157 so bpc 157 is it stands for um body protective compound not sure where the numbers come from and yeah, it's kind of famous these days. Athletes are using it, injecting it in themselves to, you know, heal sprains and breaks and all that kind of stuff. But uh, its original, it, it, its uh, original um, location where it was discovered is the stomach. It's created in the stomach, and then it's secreted in the stomach, and then um, it's healing the stomach. And you know, then you're it's going on from the stomach, so it's helping to heal the whole intestinal tract. And so um yeah using like injectable bpc may well heal your stomach if you're trying to heal your stomach uh, or just soothe your stomach as we talked about but oral bpc 157 does actually make sense if it is your stomach and your digestive tract that you're trying to you know soothe and encourage healing of so i definitely recommend that as well so that's a good collection like which is better which is worse you know the licorice one tastes of licorice so that can put some people off the aloe vera one tastes of aloe vera, so that can put some people off. Um, the other three don't have a taste. Um, but I'd say glutamine is not as powerful as the other ones I've mentioned. I would say if you have actually have an ulcer or an infection, you're going to want to take as many of those things as you can, really. Like, the more the better. Because while issues in your intestines are can be extremely painful and problematic, they're rarely life-threatening. Whereas issues in your stomach can easily become life threatening because that acid is so strong, it can burn a hole in your stomach, you then you get a bleeding ulcer, and that can kill you. That kills a lot of people every year. Um, way less now, admittedly, because all the, uh, dis as we talked about, you know, the discoveries of uh, antibiotics helping H. pylori and stuff, but it's still a significant potential medical issue, which is generally why doctors actually take stomach issues much more seriously than they take, say, you know, intestinal issues because there is that risk that's still significant of death. So I would not mess around if you know that you need soothing <laughs> your stomach. I would use as many of those things as possible uh, to soothe them. And then antibiotics, I don't really have anything to add in that other than, you know, the usual thing. Um, the only thing I would add is probably there's usually like three or four different combinations that they offer. I like the combination that includes bismuth. Bismuth is kind of a heavy metal but it's not really absorbed uh, it's in uh, something called pepto bismol um, and it basically kind of creates this protective coating i didn't put it in that category along with soothing things because it's still not safe to me as everything i just listed but you know if you're offered a choice between different uh prescription drug options i i, I would say it's probably worth it and then the other one is if you're offered a combination that includes rifaximin we'll talk about rifaximin later but Rifaximin is by far the safest of all the um, antibiotics. So, if the combination, if they offer you a choice, then I would go for the combination with rifaximin. Unless if they say it's not going to work as well, fine. I'm just saying if they offer you a choice. Yeah, because there are certain antibiotics out there that do have some serious side effects. So it is something to look at. Yeah, again, I'm not obviously giving you medical advice. I'm saying if the doctor says which do you prefer then that is what I would go with. That's in only in that situation. Yeah. And then with, I mean, I know this is an extensive area that there's a lot to go. I'm sure we could delve deeper, but I, I do want to ask, you know, with everything that you've just talked about, where are there certain things that people should look out for, you know, things that could potentially go wrong? Yeah. I mean, what I said, right, the bleeding ulcer is really where it goes wrong. That's the serious issue. In terms of an acute emergency, but in terms of what else goes wrong, that's all the stuff I talked about earlier, right? Right. 
the nutrient deficiency, the toxins, the chronic underlying, all of, all of, I won't repeat it all again, but all of that is really where it can go wrong if you don't address it. I just want to go back and say about, talk about pilot pass for a second. Like this is to me is a very great example of what I always say that the line between food and herb and supplement and drug is purely arbitrary. Like it just happens to be how it's classified. Pilopass to me is no different a drug than ivermectin or rapamycin because all of them are basically uh, the byproduct of a, of a bacteria. Like there's no difference between them. I mean, I'm glad that Pilopass is not classified as a drug. And I think the reason it's not is because it's so safe. I think it's got an excellent safety record. But that's, you know, I would actually say Pilopass is effective enough to put be put in that category of drug and maybe in some countries it is classified as it i haven't found any that are but so yeah don't dismiss things just because they're in the supplement world you know and it's the same with mastic gum because it's a herb it can't be patented and all the rest of it but i would say that you know those two are um, very powerful and should be treated with the same level of respect as an antibiotic in terms of their potential um you know, effectiveness. Well, many things do kind of start out in the supplement world. I mean, isn't aspirin from willow bark? Uh, yeah, or something absolutely. like that. I mean, like that. There no, is no, a beginning. It, no, it, yeah. it totally is. Yeah. No, I think eighty percent of drugs are uh, ultimately come from plant constituents, something like that. But what I'm saying is, like, pilopass, it doesn't. It's not like there was uh, a version of it that was natural, and then there's a drug version. I'm saying it's the same, right? It's literally just like rapamycin, which is considered a drug, like. The line between them is purely arbitrary that one is classed as a drug and one is classed as a supplement. Understood, understood. Okay, big topic. <laughs> Lots to look at, and I'm sure we could go deeper. So, you know, you guys, if you're out there and you're suffering with anything, put something in the comments for us and we can definitely delve deeper. Um, I know now we're going to be moving on to the small intestine. So, again, another big topic. Um, what about this one? Whereas the stomach was pretty much purely bacteria. What are, are there different, I'm assuming there must be different def, uh, variations here. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I need to clarify this one a little bit. They say the digestive tract is the root of uh, disease. I would say of the digestive tract, the small intestine is the root of. So the large intestine is meant to have a significant amount of bacteria. Like they say, like a really healthy person's poop is like 50 to 50 uh 30 percent bacteria something like that it's meant to have loads of bacteria in it it's also meant to have some you know fungus and all the rest of it to some small degree at least for yeast um that kind of stuff the small intestine is more contentious there is no proof that there needs to be or should be any organisms in the small intestine the reason for this is so you know going back there's a lot of argument about are we like uh a predatory animal our ancestors are we like a herbivore are we an omnivore the best i can make out and i'm not you know i don't have a time travel machine so i can't say for sure but i think the reason why we're so confusing and why you can have these people on the internet screaming at each other with completely opposite opinions both so sure they're right it seems like originally we were a largely herbivore omnivore a little bit like closer primates like a chimp or, or a gorilla or whatever <coughs> um, and then we for whatever reason you know people speculate ice age this that or the other we shifted to having a much more uh, animal based diet and that shift went along with some fundamental changes in our digestive tract one of them is that our stomach became a lot more acidic. So while we kind of have the teeth, for instance, of a herbivore, we have the stomach of a predator, you know? So um, this again, this is why I say everyone's got evidence that their side is right. And the large intestine, so generally animals that are herbivores have very big, substantial large intestines that have a lot, of microbes in there and what those microbes do is they what well, that probably the most important thing they do is they break down fiber into short chain fatty acids uh like butyrate and propionate which we'll talk about a little bit which then can be turned into fuel so that's one of the things to me that distinguishes a herbivore 
is that they have a digestive tract which contains enough of the microbes that can convert fiber into fuel. Because non-fibrous, high-calorie plant matter is just not ubiquitous enough to support most herbivores. They need to be able to turn grass and you know leaves and all the rest of it into energy, right? Predators can't do that. So a predator, if you if you give predator a fruit, if it's willing to eat it, it can get uh, fuel out of that, even if it never eats fruit. It's it's able to make that conversion, um, but it cannot do it with a leaf. It can't get or you know like uh, yeah whatever a, a leaf, let's say a leaf, twigs, all that kind of stuff. It can't make that conversion. And so back to the uh, the question about the small intestine. Then so we seem to have a large intestine, a bit more like a predator. It is not very good at making that conversion anymore. But, you know, the speculation, like the appendix, probably at one point was a much larger organ um, called a cecum, which was able, which would have been larger, would have contained a lot more of these organisms that would have been capable of doing more of this conversion from fiber into energy. Now, people who are like, you know, vegan or plant-based will say, oh, there is some conversion. And yes, there is. But, it, there doesn't seem to be enough, anyway, to make that conversion very well. So, I say all of that to say that probably originally our distant chimp ancestors or whatever you believe, um, at some point along the chain, we probably did have a large intestine that was full of microorganisms like every herbivore has. That's the point I want to make. Now we have a large intestine that's smaller, doesn't have as many microorganisms, but it still has some that still serve some important functions. So that so the large intestine is still for that to some degree, but the main thing is that it does now is it absorbs the water out of what's left to solidify the waste, um, and then there's some absorption of minerals and stuff, but there's not a huge amount going on in the large intestine from a normal mainstream medical point of view other than the absorption of water. That's the main thing that's going on there. The small intestine is really where all the action is. The small intestine is where a lot of the amino acids get absorbed. Some also get absorbed in the stomach and duodenum. Small intestine is where um, the anything other than the very broken down carbs are absorbed. And I say, so yes, if you have a heavily refined carb, like a table sugar or maybe even a honey, it probably may well be absorbed before it hits the small intestine. But the vast majority, we're talking about starches, we're talking about potato, we're talking about grains, we're talking about beans, we're talking about fruits, or you know, basically every natural source other than maybe honey. It's got to be broken down. And so that process where it's broken down and then absorbed is largely in the small intestine. And we're talking about lipids. We're talking about fats. So the fats are largely broken down by the, uh, or conjugated, let's say made ready to absorb by the bile, which they first come across in the duodenum, and the enzyme lipase from the um, pancreas, which they first come across in the duodenum. So there's not, there's no absorption of fat really going on until the duodenum at the very earliest, and basically the vast majority, again, is small intestine. So all the fats are going in for the small intestine, Almost all the carbs are going through the small intestine. A lot of the amino acids are going in through the small intestine. Um, a lot of the vitamins are going, again, fat-soluble vitamins, again, they need that the lipase and the bile first, so that's happening in the small intestine. Water-soluble vitamins, a lot are going in through the small intestine. A lot of the minerals are going through for the small intestine. Did I need to list them all? Maybe not, but just to show, it really is... The vast majority is going in for the small intestine. And we've already explained before in the digestive episode about how that works. So I won't explain it all again. But I will just say, as a reminder, the other issue with the small intestine is that it's um, about 15 feet long uh, and it has about 150 corners. So it's very easy for stuff to get... If it's going to get stuck anywhere, it's going to be in this long, thin tube with endless corners, Right. That's that's where there's mo li most likely to be an issue. So the more microorganisms you have in there, the more that you're going to have fermentation going on at best, and the more you're going to have 
the feeding of uh, organisms that, even if they're good organisms, you don't want them there. I've seen studies even about um, bifidobacteria and lactobacillus, which are considered like the most beneficial of the beneficial bacteria strains, that you can have an overgrowth of even those in the small intestine. And so you could have good bacteria being fed good food, healthy food, stuff we'd all agree is good for you. But if those bacteria in the small intestine, too many of them, even if you're feeding them good food, they're going to be creating a lot of fermentation and they're going to be creating issues because they're not meant to be there in any significant uh, quantities. How many are meant to be there? Ugh. This is all fairly new science. It's very common. I don't know, you know, you and I grew up in a fairly similar age. I used to grow up feeling like scientists already had all the answers. I don't know about you, Chrissy. Like they've already yeah. worked almost everything out, right? I'm sure they didn't do anything to try and dissuade us from that kind of impression. But like there's so much that they actually don't know. And if there's any area that they don't know much about, I would say it's the small intestine. They can't reach it from the bottom with a colonoscopy. They can't reach it from the top with an endoscopy. Yeah, sure, you can like um, cut it you know, up once the person's dead in an autopsy, but that only tells you what a dead small intestine is like, not a living one. So the only way you really see inside the small intestine usually is if you're doing an operation in someone for a few hours in the small intestine, which is usually a, you know, a difficult thing to do and you know, there's a lot of pressure and all this. Basically, people are not recreationally observing the inside of the small intestine. It just doesn't happen. So there's a lot that's not known about it. And, you know, one of the examples of this is it's only recently become apparent that a thing called SIBO is a real problem, or CIFO, which stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and small intestinal fungal overgrowth. And what I was saying earlier about how a lot of these intestinal issues, again, they tend to focus more on the large intestine with their inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel disease, diverticulitis, colitis, you know, the list goes on. But most of these issues actually happen in the small intestine as well. And they may actually happen in the small intestine more. And so uh, according to, I think it's Dr. Mark Perlmutter, who's one of the people who pioneered the the, the whole C, uh, um, SIBO research from Cedar Sinai, he talked about how um, there are just two bacteria which he believes are largely responsible for uh SIBO symptoms and uh, they are E. coli and Klebsiella. Klebsiella, uh, most famous strain of that is called Klebsiella pneumoniae and it's famous for causing pneumonia and um, one of those things that those two organisms that class of bacteria have in common is they're both antibiotic resistant. They're antibiotic yeah. resistant when they're in the lungs, but they're also, it seems, pretty antibiotic resistant when they're in the intestinal tract as well. They are naturally there in small amounts, but when they overgrow in the large intestine, that's not good. And they really shouldn't be in the small intestine at all. So how do you diagnose if you have this overgrowth? Again, because it's really hard for them to reach. It's not easy. And until recently, there was nothing, which is why they didn't know it existed, because they had no way of diagnosing it. Um, we talked about for the stomach and the stomach ulcer, and even for the duodenum, they, they shove a camera down there. For the, for the large intestine, they shove a camera up there. But how do they reach the small intestine? So the best they have these days is a, uh, what they call a SIBO breath test, which is where you breathe into a, a bunch of tubes, usually a a certain amount of time after having something, glucose, lactulose, something like that, something that feeds bacteria, and then they, they measure that gas. Um, that's like a test that normally costs like $200 and uh, you know, it takes a while to get results, but I got, uh, I think it's an awesome little device that you can buy, and there's an app on your phone, and you can actually test it anytime. What's so it called? I'll have to I have to give you a link to put okay, it underneath. Okay, yeah, afterwards. we'll put it in. We'll make sure it's in the link below. <laughs> uh, what's handy about that is the problem with that test is if the thing that you take beforehand happens to not feed the type of bacteria you have, you'll get a negative result. Right. So the good thing about that is you can try all kinds of food that you would normally eat and see what is causing that result. Um, I've, I've seen false negatives with it. You need to make sure... Let's say even if you have, I don't know, a sweet or a tea or something and then you do it afterwards, it might get a false reaction because of that. But if your mouth is completely empty of anything that could 
be creating gas. You brush your teeth. You left it long enough that the toothpaste no longer is is uh, leaving any residue. Then it's very accurate at actually being able to tell is there any gas there. And so there's three types of gas that they know is a indicator of SIBO. Uh, there's hydrogen, which indicates one type of bacteria. There's methane, which indicates another type of bacteria. And then there's hydrogen sulfide, which indicates the third type of bacteria. The last one, it, hydrogen sulfide, most difficult to deal with. And almost no one is able to test for it. <laughs> so, you know, as I said, this is evolving science. There's right. nothing final about this, unfortunately. Best indicator that you might have that is that you uh, have a reaction to sulfurous foods. Um, especially if it's all sulfurous foods. If it's only some, like if you're fine with garlic but not with onions or whatever, eh, that's probably not it. But if you have an issue of pretty much all sulfurous foods, that can indicate that's because there's some organism that eats that sulfurous food, creates this hydrogen sulfide gas. Right, 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 right. And then it's creating that byproduct as it's eating it and then causing you potential discomfort. Yeah, discomfort and more. I mean, hydrogen sulfide is quite a toxic gas. So of the three of them, the most likely to actually kind of poison you. Um, but, you know, all of them certainly can create problems uh, in excess. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code REJUVENATE. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code REJUVENATE for 20% off today. So that's testing in a nutshell. Um, it's not great. A lot of people will, along with that test, also order like a stall test where they, like a very broad spectrum one, like a GI effects or a GI map, something like that, where it's testing all kinds of other things, you know, to see, do you have leaky gut? Do you have IBD? Do you have inflammation? Do you have malabsorption? How are your levels of butyrate and various different things that if you had healthy microbiome, then they would be higher and all of that kind of stuff. So, uh, but yeah, that's the kind of test that you would do. All right. Uh, should we get into treatment? Definitely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, first line, um, I've I've gone back and forth on this a little bit, but here's the thing. I'm going to recommend a bunch of different things. These are, I, I think if you do have this, you should definitely go and see a doctor. But I know that some people just will not. I know that some people cannot. They can't afford it or whatever. So that's why I'm going to give advice anyway. Um, first line, I would say, you, that you could try is probiotics. So probiotics are generally thought of as like a recolonizing thing, and I'd classify them in that category as well. But as we talked about, there's a lot of controversy about whether they actually truly do colonize or whether they just pass through you. But the point is, even if they're only passing through you, the so-called good guys will tend to fight the bad guys. And so it can be useful anyway. Um, the best combination that I found for this is something called the uh, D. Simone formulation. It's not particularly cheap. Um, it's called different things depending on the country. D. Simone is the doctor who formulated it um, and then patented it. Um, it's something like one, one or two or three dollars even per dose, and you can have one, two or three, four doses a day. So it can add up, but it's in my opinion it's very effective and it's not just my opinion they actually have a great selection i'll put a link for it chrissy studies those studies about how it can help with a literally 
uh, I think over a dozen different digestive issues, including actually um, even stomach ulcers. So all the way from the stomach down to the large intestine, um, uh, pouchitis is one I remember, like that's unusual to see that there's benefits for. But anyway, almost every common digestive issues, there are scientific studies saying that this can help, which is interesting. And again, brings up the question, if all of these diseases are supposed to be not caused by chronic infections, why would there be research showing that these probiotics can help with all of these diseases? And there's other theories from it. I'm not saying it's, it's definite proof. You know, some are saying just because they alter the environment and then that helps the nervous system or that helps the immune system whenever it's, it's not, uh, you know, completely clear. But I think it's an indication, again, that chronic infection often is a part of it. Um, and so that's just a combination of lactobacillus and bifidobacter strains, different ones, which are you know the common types found in dairy. Um, I think the thing that's unusual about it is the dose; it's strong. So often, you know, a normal just maintenance capsule, like even the type we sell them, um, Phil Younger, I can't remember what it is, but five billion, ten million, something like that. A really strong capsule is maybe fifty billion. The dose in one of these sachets is about 500 billion or half a trillion. Oh, wow. That is a lot. So, so yeah. And, and the, as I said, the dose is one, two, three, four sachets a day. So you might be having one or two trillion a day. Um, now, you have maybe, I've seen such wildly varying estimates, but you might have 10, 20, 30 trillion bacteria in there. Most of those usually are what are called commensal, so just like neutral bacteria. So that is a lot of beneficial ones. You wouldn't normally expect to have more than two trillion probiotic bacteria in your gut at any one time, anyway. So, taking in two trillion beneficial a day, you can see how that could actually start to shift things um, into a different direction. So, that's pretty good. I would say that's not side effect free, though. Unfortunately, none of what I recommend for the small intestine really is side effect free because. Again, it's and and also for large intestine because it's so common that there is some overgrowth there, and anything that's good, unfortunately, will aggravate something that's bad and can make you feel worse. So, unfortunately, that's true for all the probiotics as well. But it's probably the least likely to make you feel bad of everything I'm going to recommend, other than uh, maybe sometimes binders are probably similar. And then, you know, the soothing agents, which we'll talk about at the end. But everything else can make you feel bad. Totally understood. Yeah, because you're kind of, you're stirring some things up. Uh, let me ask you this. If somebody, let's say they're not suffering at all with their digestive tract, or they don't know, maybe there could be something there. With something like this, this DeSimone, which is such a high, um, you know, how do you say, you know, so many billion bacteria, would that be recommended just for treatment or would that just, what is that recommended to anybody? I would not recommend it if you don't have a problem. It could create a problem okay. for the reasons I just said, yeah. right? You don't, even the beneficial bacteria are not great when they're in the small intestine. Now, if you've got bad or even commensal, like okay bacteria in your small intestine, then the good bacteria can help. But if you don't have any problem, then do not take these. This is where, um, like the feel younger blend would be better because it's like you know it's coated it sh should like stay um it should not break down the small intestine it shouldn't break down until it reaches the large intestine that's the ideal for a kind of probiotic supplement that is not therapeutic but yeah we're talking about uh, a therapeutic situation here just wanted to clarify in case somebody's like oh that sounds good i'm gonna go get some <laughs> now as you also correctly said a lot of people might not know that they have a problem you know so Maybe you should define that quickly, you know? You should be able to, at least, unless you're trying not to, eat several meals a day without it feeling too much, without you feeling bloated, without you feeling stuffed, without you feeling any kind of negative symptom. Uh, you should feel hungry at least two, maybe three or four times a day, depending on your activity level. Hungry meaning not weak, not faint, not bored, not low energy, but like a growling in the uh, kind of navel area, like uh, actually I'm full, uh, I'm, I'm empty and I need to be filled kind of sensation. Um, you need to, you should have bowel movements. Depending on your diet, uh, admittedly, if you have say a no fiber diet, like a carnivore or a certain keto diet, maybe less frequently, but if you're having a normal, even if it's low amount of fiber, then 
you know two barrel movements a day i would say is you know realistic and normal um but bottom line is though you shouldn't be thinking about your digestion <laughs> if your digestion is actually healthy so if you're watching this unless you're watching it because you're a practitioner or you're trying to help someone else there's something going on probably if you're watching it and therefore there probably is something going on that you want to address but yes if you don't you know if you know someone who doesn't have any issues don't try and recommend this to them <laughs> just leave them alone <laughs> if they're hungry several times a day and they go to the toilet often and they never have any digestive problems leave them alone <laughs> um okay so uh, other organisms commonly recommended i've heard a lot of people say benefited them um there are what are called phages uh, ph phages um B uh, subtilis is probably the most common one. Um, they're often called SBOs as well, soil-based organisms. Some people get a really good result with them. Some people have less reaction to them than they do to the other two I mentioned, Lactobacillus and Bifidobacteria. So some people really like those. I've found them to be completely pointless personally, but I've seen enough people who do not feel that way to recommend them. Um, and then ditto actually for uh, Saccharomonas curvacea. So that is a beneficial yeast. It's the only one that's commonly used and recommended. It's often recommended for a couple of different reasons. It's I've seen it recommended as an antifungal, so anti-candida. I've seen it recommended for people taking antibiotics, even of the herbal type that we're going to talk about next, because, but especially the pharmaceutical antibiotics, because they only kill bacteria. Because the idea is if you're suppressing all the bacteria in general, then often the yeast can go, oh, it's my chance to shine. So taking something like uh, Escavesa to keep the bad yeast under control is uh, often a good idea, either that or some kind of antifungal, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then the other thing I've seen it recommended for is for people with mold toxicity. Some people say it's good for um, uh, getting up mycotoxins. I haven't seen any research to back that up, but that may be the case. Um, I haven't looked into it maybe deeply enough. So those are like the categories of organisms that, are usually recommended and that you may want to try if you uh, are insisting on DIYing it when it comes to your uh, chronic <laughs> uh, digestive infection. So next, uh, things that can kill chronic digestive infections. Let's go for it. So some are quite strong and quite broad spectrum. So in that category, I will put uh, oregano oil, oregano oil, you guys call it, uh, garlic or its um, uh, constituent, allicin, also A-L-O-I-C-I-N. Um, grapeseed extract, you know, my list there. Yeah, those are the, probably the most broad spectrum. When I say broad spectrum, they'll tend to kill a broad amount of bacteria, also a broad amount of um, fungi, yeast, um, mold even and uh, potentially even parasites. So we haven't talked about parasites yet. We'll kind of, I think we'll do that at the end because they're a bit more controversial. So yeah, broad spectrum action. Some of them are more specific. So, oh, actually, sorry. And neem. Neem is pretty broad as well. Neem can kind of kill everything. Those would be the ones I'd recommend. Other ones do exist. Um, but yeah, those are the most broad spectrum ones that tend to work for a lot of people. And are very commonly in formulations for this purpose. For that reason, they're not difficult to get. Uh, berberine is another one. We talk about that in terms of weight loss. We talk about that in terms of blood sugar. We talk about that in terms of anti-aging. Um, but actually, there is some evidence that one of the main mechanisms that it works for those things is by changing the microbiome, by changing the ratio of different microorganisms. So it discourages the growth of some and encourages the growth of others. There are specific organisms that berberine is very effective for. Uh, anecdotally, from what I've seen, the SIBO organisms often are in that category. Um, I have not known it to be effective for Klebsiella, but I feel like it may be effective for E. coli, although you know every situation is different. What is more effective for Klebsiella, um, although again, also not guaranteed, is Uva Ursi that we mentioned before with the, uh, the bladder and UTI, but it's also effective potentially for that. Coconut oil is kind of weak, weakly everything again, but I didn't mention it earlier because it's it's way weaker than things like garlic or oregano oil. But it's good for you in general for all other kind of reasons. So um, that you know it's a good thing. The 
most active ingredient when it in, in within coconut oil when it comes to killing microorganisms is the caprylic acid. So caprylic acid is normally sold in one of two ways. It's either sold in like tiny quantities, like 100 milligrams or something, in a capsule as part of like some anti-candida formula or something, but or it's sold in the form of an MCT oil. So most people don't know, but a C8 MCT oil, which is uh, slightly more expensive than just your bog standard MCT oil, but still pretty common, is pure caprylic acid. So... If you're like myself and you're a big fan of MCT oils, like I, I take 50 grams, not milligrams, of caprylic acid a day <laughs> because it's an MCT oil, which is a great source of fuel for your brain and for your, you know, your organs and, and all the rest of it. Um, but yes, it's not only an excellent source of fuel that doesn't require the liver to break it down. It is also happens to be very good, especially antifungal, also to some degree antimicrobial. And then there's kind of more aromatics. So... Uh, clove oil and cinnamon oil. Um, I would not have in significant quantities. I would not dose those myself personally, but you know, within some kind of formulation, um, because we're talking about you know milligram amounts of those. Really, like an excess amount will burn you. Um, but both clove oil and cinnamon oil have this interesting quality of being able to disrupt the communication matrix that these organisms use between each other. So. Uh, I'm a big fan of cinnamon, personally. I like to add it for that reason. Uh, then there's uh, thyme, rosemary, sage as well. So the kind of herbs that you're... Uh, uh, basil. The kind of herbs that you're likely to use culinary, especially in the mm, Italian, I guess, um, culinary tradition. Uh, they are um, uh, useful as well. Are they going to resolve like a really bad thing, just like coconut oil? No. But if you've got just a bit of an imbalance, they might well be able to correct that and bring things back into balance. Uh, SF722 is uh, something that seems to be reasonably effective for uh, Candida specifically, so something that you might want to try. And then uh, there's something called Lorisidin, which is a different uh, coconut oil extract or no sorry i think coconut full stop yeah coconut seed extract um which is also i'd say medium strength fairly broad spectrum action so these are all things that you might want to uh consider taking then also traditionally recommended for as a anti-parasite formula but that does have action in in other areas as well is uh wormwood clove and black walnut which are often sold as a combination together um, but they're more of an antiparasitic. The truth is, even though that's the longest list we've done so far, it's far from complete. Like, right. There are actually loads of things, loads of everyday culinary foods, um, even things you wouldn't think of. I mean, garlic you may think of, but, you know, like uh, pomegranate rind, you know, or like uh, stuff like that that <laughs> might not occur to you as like, you know, quite powerful, but it is. Or, yeah, coconut oil, I guess, another example. So yeah, there are plenty of things that we um, that you might be consuming regularly that might be having that kind of action. And again, to go back to my point from earlier in the episode, the line between food and herb and uh, supplement and drug again is you know uh, is arbitrary. I would say you know things like garlic, oregano oil, and grapeseed extract. A lot of the criticisms of antibiotics that they're too powerful they kill too much they're too unbalancing and the rest they're just as true for those things i mean depending on dosage admittedly but like they're very very powerful they have a very strong effect oh onion i guess you know another one well very and those unique. and some of those are used prevalently in everyday cooking so it's 100 oh, percent. yeah so then it goes to you know to ask well well, should it be used for everyday cooking or should it be just saved for medicinal times? It's a very good question. I mean, you brought up the quote earlier of let food be your medicine. That's a contentious thing, you know? Like one of the things that people who are in the carnivore diet are pushing, which I found interesting, even though I'm not a carnivore, is this idea that, you know, almost every plant has these defense chemicals in them and to some degree, all of them are toxic to human beings. And this is true. Now, you know, the defense of that, of course, is it's no big deal. We've adapted to them, all the rest of it. Um, but 
it's true you know like every single thing I, I don't, there was not one animal there right every single thing that we just talked about is a plant compound and every other thing that i didn't talk about <laughs> pretty much is a plant compound and so these are all pl you know we talked about how oh you know pre um if you take a, a probiotic like a bifidobacteria that's gonna help because it's fights the other bacteria well what else is trying to protect itself from bacteria and fungus and parasites and all the rest of it? It's plants. And again, they don't have teeth, they don't have claws, they can't run away, so they're using chemicals. So this is the argument for, like, that, you know, what they say is that animal food should be food and plants should be medicine. So it's not that you shouldn't have plants, but it's just realize that they have a medicinal quality. So... Should you be, should your everyday staple food be medicines? That's kind of the question that you're asking. And the answer is, depends. Right. <laughs> depends, <laughs> yeah. depends on it's your a opinion. Good point. Yeah, it's a real, that's a really good point. I mean, because, you know, looking at things, no matter whether you, you do have the carnivore diet or a few more of the vegetarian, and we're all consuming energy. You know, and and a lot of those things that we we look at as energy, they don't want to be consumed. <laughs> so yeah. you know, really, none of them other than arguably no. fruit. Yeah, you know, yeah. There's, there's literally fruit. Oh, fruit and dairy, actually. Yeah. You know, obviously dairy. In that case, you could say, well, you're stealing it from someone else. Yes, but the point is, both of them are designed to be consumed. Everything else doesn't want to be consumed. Absolutely, and is trying to defend itself in various ways. You know, maybe that's that's a bit of a non-answer to your question. So let me answer more specifically. So, okay, every plant basically has some defense chemicals which kill some organism to some degree, but should we be using some of the most powerful plant defense chemicals with every meal? Like, and I think the most common example is garlic and onions, you know? I spent years working in an uh, uh, Italian restaurant. Every single thing you prepare pretty much has garlic and onions in, and I feel like 100 years ago that was not the case for, I don't know, people with my ancestry, but nowadays it is like and again because most people eat processed food and packaged food and all that it's adding to everything people who try and avoid garlic and onions as you know chrissy we, we used to be part of a community where you were advised to avoid them it's in everything it's easier to avoid sugar or gluten or whatever than it is to avoid garlic and onions it's in absolutely everything i personally don't think it's a good idea i think it's in balancing the other question is if you're used if you've been doing it for the last 40 years is it a good idea to suddenly stop also maybe not because You've been suppressing, you know, all of these organisms for all that time by taking these things. If you suddenly stop, are they suddenly going to start growing and you feel worse? That's also possible. So there's the, is it a good idea theoretically? Maybe not because it's suppressing everything. Maybe because it's suppressing everything, depending on your point of view. Is it a good idea to suddenly stop? Maybe not. You know, I didn't list it here, but uh, nicotine and tobacco is a, a very powerful anti-bacterial, you know, anti-everything as well. And I think this, you know, it's used as a medicine in uh, a lot of South America and North America, where it originally came from. And um, I think, you know, there's maybe some argument to why people feel worse when they stop having it, other than the addiction. Maybe it's because it's suddenly not suppressing all kinds of organisms that it was suppressing before. So it's a complicated one. It's, it's hard to say. I take it on a case-by-case -case basis. But, you know, the other criticism that's made of these um everything i just listed uh in the the herb category other than you know obviously it's maybe imbalancing to the microbiome or the microorganism you know com uh, composition is it's also toxic if it's toxic to them it's toxic to us to some degree now some more than others i mean everything i listed there probably the most famously toxic toxic would be wormwood um that if you take not even that much of it it can kind of give you hallucinations it's uh in absinthe um for that reason it's uh it's you know pretty strong but it's not just wormwood every single thing even i guess including coconut oil although that would be the mildest of all of them uh to some degree if it's toxic to those microorganisms it is toxic to us to some degree so that's that's the trade-off that we make no i think that's you know <laughs> It's a lot in there. I think they got this whole episode is a lot and there's so much more to go into. But, you know, you've covered covered so much. So what's next on the list as far as like treatment or soothing or or um, that for the small intestine? Well, there's an additional problem that is true everywhere, but is especially tricky to deal with in the small intestine. 
and that is biofilms. We talked about biofilms already in the last episode. So biofilms are, but if you have your own biofilm that your immune system lives in, but then there is also the biofilm that some of these, especially pathogenic organisms create, which they use to not only live in, but also hide in and hide from your immune system. So sometimes everything that we listed so far is enough, more than enough. Sometimes it's not. And when it's not, one of the options that you have available to you is to take things that will break down that biofilm. Now, we definitely get into the category here, although we already were in it, where it is definitely better to get advice before you get into this. Because if you start taking a pathogenic but dormant organism and then kind of like... Stirring the pot, getting it going... I like the analogy more of like ripping the duvet off when <laughs> someone's asleep and they get up and start running after you and screaming at you. It, I think that's a better That's a better visual. For, yeah. <laughs> that really is what it like. Like you're pulling away the covers, you're exposing them, and you're angering them. So, um, so yeah, in that category, you know, it's usually enzymes, like we talked about uh, in the last episode, protease, cellulase, uh, but all of them, I can't remember all the A's, catalase, they all end in A's, um, <laughs> uh, that break that down. And there's also EDTA, which is um, a powerful heavy metal detoxifier, it's usually used for, but it also detoxifies, uh, I don't know what's the word detoxifies, also breaks down calcium, for instance. So sometimes they form a calcium shell around themselves as a, as a way of protecting themselves. So that's why people use EDTA. And they'll say use mercury and stuff that's too toxic for the immune system to get to as like a, as a protective barrier. They're, they're very sophisticated again. Um, so yeah, there's biofilm disruptors. Those are the most intense ones, the ones containing like enzymes and EDTA more, Subtle ones are, um, you know, various herbs and stuff like we talked about, like cinnamon oil that we just talked about, for instance, is a biofilm disruptor, uh, pomegranate um, extract, quince. Um, there's a bunch of different, uh, like, fruits and vegetables and herbs and stuff, which are also biofilm disruptors. But generally, if you really want to go for it, it's more the enzymes that are going to really dissolve that biofilm and expose the pathogen underneath. And what would be an indicator that that is the path that you need to take? If nothing else works that we've listed so far, it, it, even though it's not need to take, it might want to take. I'm going to prevent present a couple of options here. So another option would be the pharmaceutical option. So in terms of bacteria, the type that I've seen much more preferentially prescribed by, not necessarily alternative, can be MDs, but let's just say informed uh, practitioners would be rifaximin. Um, rifaximin is fairly unique among antibiotics in that it's uh, less than 1% of it is actually absorbed from the intestines into the bloodstream. So I think they originally found it by accident. Um, so why is that a good thing? Because a lot of the side effects of antibiotics are because it gets absorbed into bloodstream. And of course it does. I mean, think about it. If you have a kidney infection or a skin infection or whatever, how is swallowing a pill helping, right? It must be because it's being absorbed. So rifaximin is actually unique in that it's not absorbed. And so that means it stays in your intestine. And so at least it's not causing any issues beyond your intestine. And it also means uh, its power is not diluted. You know, its, its effect is primarily, well, exclusively almost in the digestive tract, which is where you want it that's we have the infection um so it's much safer for that reason it's still not side effect free because of course if you're killing organisms that are not wanting to be killed that they may well react um and you know may cause other issues but it's less side effects than most uh the main problem is that it's expensive it's i mean over here the uk it's like 10 times the price of something like penicillin um i think in the us it's even more so if you if, if insurance won't cover it, then it's not nothing. I uh, you know so it depends on your financial situation if if you're able to do it, and of course it depends on the, if the practitioner is going to prescribe it to you in the first place. But I would say practitioners often don't prescribe it because it is so expensive. So if your well being is more of a priority for you than money in this in that moment, um, I would ask about rifaximin. 
right? Obviously, your prescriber, you know, maybe they'll say, oh, no, that doesn't work for this, what you've got, fine. But you can ask them and they might say, oh, it's expensive, are you sure? And then you have that choice to make. Um, so that's a possibility. Uh, it could be a fungal infection, as we talked about. And in that case, um, the same stuff I mentioned last time, but again, I see nystatin is most preferentially used usually as being overall the most effective to safe kind of profile. Um, but I think the difference between nystatin and other antifungals is not as, as big as the difference between your faximin and other micro antimicrobials, but still seems to be kind of more preferentially recommended. Um, sometimes doctors will give both because you take even sometimes um, if you're taking herbal antimicrobials, because as we talked about earlier, if you're suppressing the bacteria a lot, then the bacteria, uh, the um, the yeast or whatever can, the candida or whatever can take the opportunity exactly to proliferate. Um, and then yeah, let's talk about parasites. We haven't talked about them so far. So parasites again, all these organisms are parasites really, but. Parasites is usually what we refer to like worms and other such creatures. Usually what we mean by parasites is basically organisms that are a lot bigger than the rest. They're a lot bigger than yeast, mold, uh, bacteria, whatever. They're many multicellular organisms. So parasites are an interesting one. In the Western, I don't know what the politically correct term is, but let's say Western. You can correct me in the comments. Um, in the Western world, it's generally considered that like adults don't get parasites or rarely get parasites unless you got them by going to some other tropical country, usually. Children get them for some reason. That That's okay to say that. It's fairly commonly, antiparasitics are fairly commonly prescribed for children, but for some reason, adults don't get them. Um, they're also not really tested for. Again, unless you say you've been to a tropical country recently and you have the symptoms for it, then they might test you for it. There's a conspiracy around this that, like... Actually, a lot more people, again, adults in the Western world do have them. And for some reason, it's not tested for. I don't know if it's true, but I've seen enough evidence, not for a conspiracy, but for at least a mistake. Like there may well be a lot more adults who have it, not just children, and it's just not being tested for and not being acknowledged. Right. I was going to say, yeah, because it could just be like people or, you know, whomever doctors or whomever's looking and just like, oh, no, that's not the case. You know, maybe just disregarding it, not even checking. Yeah, I think disregarding is part of it. I mean, um, a, a white blood cell marker, which is common, like the type of test that you and I do, Chrissy, uh, eosinophils, a particular type of white blood cell. And if that's elevated, that indicates parasites. But I've noticed even when it is indicated, no doctor ever goes, oh, you might have parasites, let's check for it, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty rare um, that they actually bother checking for it. So you may want to consider an antiparasitic because they're fairly safe. Now, the other, the, the conspiracy around parasites is that actually the parasite causes a lot more common diseases. Um, like your, was it malignant neoplasms? That's the big conspiracy. And the, the evidence for that, that they use, is that antiparasitics often inexplicably, and this is admitted in the mainstream scientific medical literature, seem to explicably, inexplicably be effective at treating those. Right. Some, yeah, sometimes. It would make so because if, Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Always. But if it wasn't the parasite, then why would it be effective? Well, they have other theories, but that's a good question. That's where the conspiracy comes from, right? So um, wormwood, cloves, black walnut that we mentioned earlier, oregano oil, garlic, grapeseed extract, neem, uh, caprylic acid, clove oil, cinnamon oil. Uh, a lot of the things that we talked about earlier are all antiparasitics as well. And then there's you know ivermectin. Um, which, you know, became infamous recently, but there's, uh, you know, a Nobel Prize for the people who discovered it, and it seems to be effective not just for parasites, but also for viruses, also for malignant neoplasms. Then there's fenbendazole, which is a very interesting one. Um, just like avamectin, very, very safe, even for long-term use. Um, there is a doctor who cured himself of stage four you know what 
only by taking fenbendazole, according to him. And he has a blog. We'll we'll link to that. He is uh, maybe not blog, but whatever. He's got a website about it where he gives a protocol. And um, there's a bunch of people who are saying that that has worked for them. Uh, there's albendazole, which is another similar form uh, compound, which again helps with parasites. My experience of all those is they are very safe and side effect free, and that's not just my experience. As I say, that's what the research seems to back up. Um, I'd say they're at least as safe as rifaxim, and maybe more. So it's a thing that you may not have it, but there's probably no harm in doing a course of these things. Yeah, that was going to be my next question, like I had asked earlier about the probiotics. You know, if somebody's like, ooh, maybe, you know, so it sounds like mm, it couldn't, might not hurt, you know, might not be a bad thing. No, no harm is probably going a bit too far, but for right. people who are open to, I personally classify them as safer than garlic. This is the thing. Interesting. It's not that, it's I mean, not that's that a they're statement. safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not that they're safe. It's just that they're more safe. Like they're going to be less disruptive to the overall intestinal environment. They're going to be less disruptive to the uh, microbiome. They're going to be um, uh, less you know, toxic overall. The toxicity of uh, you know, ivermectin and fermentazole, at least extremely low. Um, at the doses that are usually used. So, yeah, uh, uh, you know, compared to garlic, compared to neem, compared to grapeseed extract, compared to wormwoods, uh, they're pretty safe. So, again, don't do anything, obviously, based on what I say about checking out of a healthcare practitioner and do your own research, but I'm just opening your mind to a possibility for you to explore and make your own decisions about. Absolutely. I mean, those are really good points. I mean, that is why we we do this is to, you know, expand the mind, put the power back into the individual's hand because, you know, like you say, for this one doctor that you did mention, you know, by taking this one thing, he's, he's well, put himself into remission or cured himself in that way. I, I'm not familiar with it. But, I mean, that's that's something of it's for somebody to take note of. Yeah. It's something to investigate whether you believe it or not. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the next category, let's say that all that's worked or working and you've killed or are killing those organisms. How about now? Again, as we talked about in the last episode, organisms don't like to be killed. They often fight back with their own chemical defenses. So how about helping that process with binders? Um, so there's a couple of categories of binders. There's charcoal, which I've talked about before, activated charcoal, very good, very effective. Um, there's clays, like be it uh, bentonite and zeolite. So I kind of put them all in one category. And then the other category is different types of soluble fibers. Um, so there's loads of them out there, different ones that people will recommend. I'll, I'll list my three favorites um, for this purpose. So there's uh, acacia gum, which um, is a very soothing, I'd say it's the most soothing of all the fibers. It's also the least likely to cause any problems. Why, did, why would it cause a problem? Let me step back for a second. Soluble fibers feed bacteria pretty much universally. Um, so you want to be careful about um, taking them if you have any kind of chronic infection in your digestive tract. You may well be feeding something that then creates more fermentation, more gas, more inflammation, and makes things worse. Acacia gum is one of the safest in that regard of not doing that as much in most cases and just helping to soak up toxins and move them through. Um, another one that is a soluble fiber um, is uh, modified citrus pectin. This is actually so soluble that it seems to cross the, um, the intestinal barrier into the bloodstream. And so there's evidence that it can help to detoxify not just the intestines, but also the blood. Um, so that's a really good one, especially if you think or if you know that you also have heavy metals and pretty safe, again, for not feeding bacteria in a way that you don't want. And the last one definitely can feed bacteria in a way you don't want. So this is probably more something that you want to have at the end of a treatment, except for in a specific situation. And that's um, partially hydrolyzed guar gum, sometimes called sun fiber. Uh, it's one of the top recommended fibers. As I said, you either would use it after a course of herbal or pharmaceutical anti-whatevers, uh, antimicrobials usually, but sometimes it's recommended during because it does feed bad bacteria, it can stop it hiding. So we talked about one of the problems is that these um, 
especially bacteria will become dormant and hide underneath biofilm. So if you take some of that sun fiber, PHGG, it will, it's like one of their favorite food and they'll come out of hiding to eat it and then the antimicrobial will kill them. So I've seen both strategies recommended, either after or during, but only for that purpose. Otherwise, it's kind of counterproductive. And that gets to, you know, another aspect of this, which is not feeding them. So we started off talking about fiber, but there's a few different strategies for this. And it does depend on what you're talking about. Let's do the simplest first. Parasites, you can't really avoid feeding them. So don't worry about it. So we're really talking about bacteria or like the class of fungals, which includes includes like yeast and mold. Um, so bacteria, different bacteria eat different things. So it's actually hard to know for sure without having done extensive testing. If you do extensive testing, it will tell you what kind of bacteria you have, and it will tell you these are the kind of things it likes to eat, these are the kind of things that can help to get rid of it. I do recommend that. Would that be like the GI effects or something like that would be able to tell you that? Okay. Exactly, yeah. And the Genova one, I think that's the GI effects. You know, it's very user-friendly, and it will give you, you have this, we recommend this kind of recommendations that are easy for the non-practitioner to be able to read and understand. So there's a few different diets recommended for people with chronic infections and, you know, other issues, but they kind of overlap. One is the low FODMAP diet. So low FODMAP stands for uh, fermentable oligosaccharides, monosac uh, no, no, disaccharides, monos mal I can't remember the whole thing. But basically, <laughs> <laughs> they're different types of carbohydrate, which are types of, and fibers. And a, a fiber is just a very complex carbohydrate. It's so complex that your body can't digest it, but a bacteria can. So it's different types of complex carbohydrates, basically. Um, and there are particular ones that bacteria like to eat, like the ones I didn't remember all of, the disaccharides and um, oligo and whatever, like like lactose, like uh, maltose, like um, blanking, but whatever. There's a, there's a list of them. If you look up what FODMAP means, it's the full list. So uh, this originally actually came from the IBS world. Um, from how to reduce the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome. So the theory back then, still the theory to some degree now, is that the problem is gas, and then the person is sensitive to the gas and it causes them pain. So they figured, oh, let's just not feed the bacteria, then they won't create as much gas, then the person won't be in pain. That was the logic. Now there may that may also be that may be true, but it may also be true to say, well, let's not feed the bacteria because they're not good and they're creating toxins and you have a, an infection, basically, right? But either case, low FODMAP diet helps a lot of people. Another option would be a low sugar diet. So low sugar in the sense of like fructose. Um, that helps in some cases, especially uh, people who have more of a fungal infection. They usually would avoid that. The more complex the carbohydrate, generally the more likely it is to be an issue. So ironically, the very type of carbohydrate that you're told not to have because they create too much of a blood sugar spike are the ones that still create a blood sugar spike, but they're least likely to feed the bacteria. Interesting. Because the bacteria, basically, the further along your digestive tract you get, the more bacteria there should be. Even if it's kind of messed up, still that's going to be the true. So you're going to have more in your large intestine than your small intestine. You're going to have more in your small intestine than your duodenum. You're going to have more in your duodenum than the stomach. So the further down you get, the more bacteria there are. So if you have like pure glucose tablet, for instance, and you put it in your mouth, that can be dissolved straight through your mouth, straight through the um, subliminal into yeah. the bloodstream. Yeah. Never touches digestion, never feeds an organism. So that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum, like um, uh, I don't know, a piece of celery or something like that, pretty much none of the carbs in there are digestible by you. It's only going to feed bacteria if it feeds anything. And so, and I'm not picking on celery, celery is great, but just, you know, as an extreme example on the other side of the uh, spectrum, spinach, whatever, that kind of stuff, right? And then there's in between, right? So the next level of complexity after glucose, depending on how you look at it, could be like either sucrose or fructose, so maybe like a fruit, um or table sugar, or honey, maple syrup, that kind of stuff. And that may be fine if you have a bacterial issue and no fungal. That may agree with you, because it's quickly absorbed into the bloodstream. Um, but it won't agree with you if you do have a fungal, and it might not agree with you even if you don't, 
if you it, some bacteria that will still feed. Um, on the other hand, starch generally is the most tolerated of the carbs for people with these chronic infections in their digestive tract because it's a simple sugar. Uh, it's basically glucose. It's just long chains of glucose for your body to break down. So starch tends to be the safest in my experience, but not everyone agrees on that. Ray Pete, who we've talked about often, his opinion was don't have starch, have fructose. Obviously, the people who follow him, at least some of them, completely agree. That's their experience, that the starch feeds the bacteria and not the fructose. So, um, and certainly Klebsiella, that we talked about earlier, seems to feed on starch. So that would be at least one example where that's definitely accurate. Honestly, pretty much all carbohydrate will feed these organisms, both bacteria and fungal, to some degree. And so the ideal situation from a not feeding them point of view would to be on like a ketogenic diet, basically no carb. Any carb you, and no carb and no fiber, basically. Any carb or fiber you have will to some degree feed them. So it's always a compromise. That's why a just a, 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 a strategy of only starving the organism with none of the other stuff we just talked about often doesn't work. So people are like, oh, I'm on a candida diet. What are you doing? I'm just you know eating low carb. Okay, that's great. You may feel better, but eventually you're going to want to have carbs again, and it probably may not have resolved it unless you have a very strong you know metabolism, the immune system, and then it might have been enough. But that's why it often isn't anyway. That's why there needs to be more to it. So carbs are often the problem. Carbs, including fiber, because fiber is just a complex form of carb. But they're not the only one. Some bacteria feed on different amino acids. Some bacteria feed on uh, polyphenols, which are the constituents in plants. Some of them feed on uh, bile, as I talked about earlier. Um, none of them really feed on fat. <laughs> so um, you could have a pure fat diet, uh, and that would not feed them. Uh, but yeah, basically, uh, almost anything could potentially feed them, which is why you still got to eat in most cases. So that's why the other kind of stuff that we've talked about makes sense. If none of that works, the kind of last um, resort generally of the, actually a last resort after antibiotics uh, in this kind of world is something called an elemental diet. So there's different versions of it, but what it basically is, is it, resolves the problem I've just been outlining for the last okay. five to ten minutes. So basically, <laughs> it gives you um, amino acids in the form of amino acids rather than a complex protein. Why? Because if you're eating a complex protein, it takes quite a while for your body to break that down into individual amino acids. It's probably not going to happen until they reach the small intestine, for a lot of them, where the bacteria can eat them. But if you take individual amino acids that are already broken down into individual amino acids, then they likely will be absorbed within the stomach and duodenum. They never reach the small intestine. They never get a chance to feed the bacteria. Same thing with carbs. Usually these formulas either have like glucose or maltodextrin, the type that athletes use for incredibly quick absorption, basically, which is not good in most cases unless you are an athlete because it creates a blood sugar spike followed by a crash. You know, you're not having the um, fiber, uh, which will slow down the speed at which the sugar goes into the bloodstream. So it's generally not recommended unless you're an athlete, unless you're specifically very temporarily trying to starve these microorganisms. So you would have a very s simple amino acids, you know, uh, pre-digested amino acids, uh, simplest sugar possible, like dextrose or maltodextrin, and then, you know, the most easily absorbed fat, which I would say probably would be an MCT oil. So it's something like that. And then uh, like a multivitamin and mineral with it. And there are a few different companies, like mainstream ones like Nestle, and then also, you know, a couple of alternative ones as well that um, will sell like these elemental diet meal shakes. And so generally they're given to people who are like in hospital, you know, feeding tube, that kind of stuff to give all the nutrients you need in the most simple to digest form possible, but they're also used for this purpose. Um, again, strongly recommended not to do this without being over, 
that yeah. overseen by yeah. a, a qualified professional. I'm only telling you about it so you can ask your doctor about it, not so you can just go off and do it. I say that not to protect myself, honestly, because it's not a particularly good idea. From what I've seen, people talk about the side effects are worse than everything else we've talked about. Like it's actually better to take antibiotics than elemental diet in terms of the amount of havoc that it creates. From what I've seen, though, it is very effective. So they say usually the effectiveness of like antibiotic stroke herbal f things is about 50%. Not that it doesn't work, but more that it just comes back again after a while. Right. Whereas the effectiveness of an elemental diet is something like 80%. So that sounds like it's only 30% better, but if you really look at it, what it means is two and a half times less people Relapse end up. or go back. Exact exactly, yeah. In a way, it's two and a half times more effective. I guess that's what I'm saying. So it is a last resort because, you know, for the reasons I said, it's, it's first of all, probably the main one is it's spiking your blood sugar massively and causing blood sugar chaos. Um, you know, it's a weird diet for your body, right? It's got to adapt to something completely unnatural. Um, it's not great in many ways, but of course it is better than a unresolved chronic infection if, if you are down to a last resort. And then lastly, oh yeah, a couple of other things. Soothing. So we talked about this already. I'll just repeat the list from before. DGL, glutamine, zinc harnessine, uh, BPC-157. And then with this one, I will also add Phymosin Alpha-1 to boost the immune system. Uh, I think it's more important in this case. Why didn't I mention it with the stomach? Because with the stomach, the antimicrobials that I recommended work pretty well, usually, if you just follow the directions. With everything we listed here, as we said, there's only like a 50% success rate on average, statistically. So any help you can give your immune system to dealing with this, great. So Phymosin Alpha 1 and then also Phymosin Beta 4 because, you know, that inflammation is especially an issue in the small intestine. So if you can help to address that, then great. And the last thing I have in my list here, Chrissy, is, um, you know, the thing that you mentioned earlier, which is the uh, enemas and colonics. So right. that would be in the category of hygiene. So... I would say out of everything on this list, this is the most effective at uh, symptom relief temporarily, but unfortunately it's the least effective at actually resolving anything. Makes sense. Which is unfortunate because, you know, especially if it were like a really thorough colonic or something, you might like flush 99% of the bacteria out of your large intestine, especially. The problem is they just grow right back again. Like it, it does nothing to um, to actually resolve the situation. It's never going to be a hundred percent, and so you know, as long as there is some left, they will grow right back again. Um, but because it is flushing out, maybe you know, if it's very thorough, depending on the technique and whatnot, such a large percentage of the organism, it can definitely leave you feeling a hell of a lot better temporarily, which is why a lot of people really enjoy them. Um, I'm not against enemas and clonics. The time that I think they're much more actually effective is with toxins as opposed to microorganisms. So some people are doing, you know, um, a type of detoxification regime where they're attempting to flush toxins out. And one of the main mechanisms for that is through the bile. And the problem is like 95 plus percent of the bile gets reabsorbed in the uh, small and to some degree large intestine. And so if you do like uh, enemas, it can really help to flush that bile out before your body gets a chance to reabsorb it. So if you're going to do it, I'm more of a proponent of the benefit of it for that reason, but I'm not really a benefit uh, proponent for the benefit of it in the case of a chronic infection. Uh, you know, both in theory and in experience, unfortunately, it just doesn't seem to work in uh, many cases. Although sometimes it does. If the person's already pretty strong and they've just got a little bit imbalanced, there's possible just flushing everything out. The immune system takes over. Everything's good. That does happen. You know, I, I trained in colonic hydrotherapy. I uh, spoke to someone who'd been doing it for, I don't know, 20 years for a week, hearing their stories and anecdotes and, you know, experience and the rest. And there are some cases of people come and that's it. But unfortunately, there's a lot of cases where people keep coming and it's for that very reason, because it is uh, relieving, but not resolving. Right, right, right. So that's something to look at. I mean, like for me, for my experiences, I discussed in the previous one, that really did help clear things up. But but who's to also know or say, you know, the other things that I was doing as well that were potentially solving it, but definitely um, supported me 
in a, in a very big way. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm open to the fact you might be in that minority where it just well, for whatever reason, maybe there was some toxin that was just as I said stuck in there. Um, there was some, maybe some toxin that kept recirculating in the bile, and then you just flush a lot of it out, and then you you know that's enough to bring yeah. you back into balance and you feel good again. It's definitely possible. Yeah. Well, this is. Well, I mean, wow. <laughs> wow. Um, you did mention as we went through, because I've been asking this along the way, anything to watch out for, but you did mention that with like the biofilms and in the case of other things to take to what to look out for. So, I mean, if there's any, are there any other things that people should watch out as they're doing these? Uh, I think I covered Yeah, I think you did. Yeah, I think you did too. So, I mean, what's nice, yeah. you're covering them in the way as you're discussing them. So, uh, so that's it for the small intestine. I mean, then we have the large intestine. So is there anything different? Is it the same? Or, you know, where are we at with the large intestine? Yeah, I've got one word note here, and it's just same. Um, <laughs> I, I, I you know I basically explained it all in detail with the small intestine that usually that's the root of the issue. As I said, the other thing with the large intestine is it's not that hard to just clear it out. Like, you you know, talked about enemas and clonics, but ditto about laxatives, right? There was a theory going around like a decade or two ago that most disease was um, based on the large intestine, that people had this plaque in there and they had, you know, all these toxins and all the rest of it. And then doctors were like, what are you talking about? We give people a laxative, they come in the next day for a colonoscopy, we stick a camera up there and it looks clean as anything. Like, <laughs> it's n no problem whatsoever. And they're not wrong. They're not lying. Like, it is not hard to clean out. Obviously, it's not. You know, it's not, uh, what's the word? It's not eat off it clean, but um, <laughs> it's clean enough, like 99% of the waste and toxicity and microorganisms and everything can be cleared out of large intestine pretty easily. So it's not really the root of the problem in most cases. The root of the problem is the small intestine. And that's why it will grow right back again, even if you flush it all out. Um, that's why it's so difficult to resolve. Now, you can do beneficial things for the large intestine to encourage, uh, you know, the growth of the more beneficial organisms to suppress the growth of the bad ones. But it's all the stuff we've really talked about, you know, suppressing the bad ones with all the herbs we've talked about and antibiotics and stuff, uh, promoting the growth of the good ones with the fibers we talked about, soothing it with all the soothing agents we've really talked about. I'm not saying that the large intestine doesn't matter or you shouldn't do anything about it, but I'm just saying everything I've already recommended uh, will also help the large intestine. And usually the large intestine isn't really the root of the problem, even if that's where you have the problem. Look, don't get me wrong. Someone might put a camera up there and said, yeah, there is a problem there. You know, there's a pocket, there's, you know, it's bleeding, it's whatever. Like there's all kinds of issues that can happen there. Um, but I'm saying that uh, the treatment for the small intestine, there's nothing missing from that that I would also add for the large intestine. Wonderful. Okay, so refer back to the small intestine if you've got something going on in the large intestine because you're most likely going to find it in there. So do those things. Um, okay. <sighs> A lot to unpack in that. Um, I know in the first um, part one of this, we did discuss the difference between acute and chronic. And I wanted to ask, you know, here in this section and in, in part two and in part three here, we've really gone over how to help those chronic infections. And going back into it with the acute infections, let's say somebody's getting that recurrently, recurrently, could it be that a chronic infection is potentially impacting an acute or no? Are they completely separate? No, they're not necessarily. Um, I mean, I'd say it's. I would treat recurrent acute as if it were a chronic, whether it is or not. So obviously deal with the acute infection by seeing a doctor, seeing a medical professional, deal with it as the emergency it is. But then once the emergency is over, um, I would deal with it as if it's a chronic infection. But I mean that in the broadest possible sense. And remember... Even though I said it before, and I don't love to repeat myself, I did it again at the beginning of this episode, strengthening the whole system, strengthening the body is the first step to resolving a chronic infection. So that would be my initial focus. Why do I keep getting acute infections? Could be two reasons. Either my system is so weak or imbalanced that I keep genuinely contracting them over and over again, like they genuinely go and they genuinely come back, or... And then strengthening myself is the more important priority. Or they never actually go. They just 
flare up, calm down, flare up, calm down. In which case, it is really a chronic infection that becomes acute periodically, in which case I would treat it as a chronic infection once the acute phase has calmed down. Wonderful. Okay, so that's something to look at. And again, as you mentioned, we went over in the beginning, part one, but also at the beginning of this episode, look at those things. Okay, so then, all right. And in part two, we discussed um, bladder and the urinary tract. Now, something that I've heard a lot or that I do speak to people that they do have is the chronic inflammation of the, you know, the UTIs where it's just something that's consistent. It's just the constant. They always have it. Would that just be, as then are we looking at a fully systemic chronic infection in the whole body with that pain? Or is there something else going on there? Well, it's the same answer I just gave of at a plus more. So it could be um, a chronic infection that flares up into an acute infection. And so the thing to do there would be to realize when the acute symptoms go away, don't assume it's fully resolved and try and actually deal with a chronic infection all the ways we talked about in the last episode. Um, or if you keep contracting it, it's because the, you're really weak in some way and the imbalance. So back to that. And then, um, you know, in the case of the, the, the bladder and the urethra specifically, there is this thing called interstitial cystitis, which is basically cyst is um uh what they call the bladder and uh, in latin i think and then tit itis is uh, inflammation so it, it just means inflammation it's no different from irritable bowel syndrome whatever it's just it, it just means inflammation of the organ and so it doesn't necessarily mean it's an infection so it's either a chronic infection that's flaring up or there is actually no infection there and it is your own immune system that's reacting to something and that's something I would say is often a toxin. And the root cause, I mean, it could be anything, but I would start with the intestines, which I think I did say in the last episode as well. Um, in, my, in my experience, when a person has that over and over again and the antibiotics aren't working or whatever, they need to look at what's going on in their digestive tract. And uh, the proof of that, and again, it doesn't resolve anything as we just talked about, but often a, just a colonic or an animal will make them feel better. And so then it's like, well, that's because, yes, I know you're feeling it in your urethra, and I'm not denying that. I, I'm not saying even that it's referred pain. I believe there's something going on specifically there, but the actual root of it um, often is in the intestine. And if you just resolve the intestinal issue, the inflammation calms down and then the cystitis goes away. Okay, yeah, because that interstitial cystitis, it's, it's not necessarily meaning that, I mean, that's just a... It's a it's a, the inflammation in the area. It's not necessarily meaning that it's a specific UTI at that moment, even though that that's where the pain is potentially presenting. No, it just means inflammation. I mean, right. uh, other options that we talked about, like in the chronic pain episodes, is it could be tension. So it could be the fascia uh, because of emotion, trauma, tension, maybe even injury, tightening around this area, and that inflames it. That you know causes pain. And then the last option that I can think of um, is toxicity. You know, so one of the main ways that your body fl uh, flushes out toxicity is through, obviously, the gallbladder and the bile and the intestines, like we talked about. But another is through from the blood to the kidneys to the bladder to the urethra to out. And so it may well be worth doing a urinary heavy metals test, which is not that expensive. You can usually get that done for like $100 for a quite a broad spectrum one and see if there's anything significant there. And the other thing that I already mentioned in the last episode is check the pH. If it is very acidic, that could be irritating and burning it. Yeah, all very good points. Okay, so get those checked out. Um, I want to jump back to the digestive tract because the, the tongue and the mouth, as I think we did briefly discuss it in part two, but there are different coatings. There are different things that are showing on the tongue, whether it's a yellow coat when you first wake up or white or things like that. So if, if there's certain... Um, how can I say, clues that your body is presenting. I mean, what do those mean? If somebody's noticing that when they first wake up before they brush their teeth and like, oh my gosh, my tongue is so white. Like, what would that lead them down the path to discover? That there's something going on in the digestive tract and, you know, specifically the stomach. Uh, so that was what we talked about um, in the first part where your body will create this mucus layer to protect itself from either acid reflux, but it could also be this peptin 
which is eating away at and irritating the uh, tissues. And yeah, the other ish, uh, the other potential is uh, an infection. So it could be an infection of the throat, could be an infection of the tonsils, could be an infection of the gums, could it be an infection of the sinuses. And you know, the general kind of TCM perspective on this is that white would indicate um, like damp, so that's more phlegm, mucus. So uh, an attempt by the body to soothe irritation and inflammation. Whereas if it's more like yellow, then that would indicate an active infection. That's what they believe. I have an alternative theory that the yellow is uh, more toxin, uh, specifically the the vitamin A kind of beta carotene toxin. I'm not 100% sure about that, certainly, but, you know, it's another possibility. Um, but I think in either case, like the uh, the treatment of it is the same stuff that we've been talking about all along. It's a sign of either an infection or toxicity. In either case, it's inflaming, and then the body is reacting either with mucus or with dead white blood cells or a combination of both. Um, and so the number one place that I would look at is the chronic infections that are local to it. So gums, sinuses, throat, and then potentially, if it's not that, silent reflex coming from the stomach. Okay. Then um, microbiome. I mean, that's massive. And we just been, we have been spending this time really talking about the organisms that are in the gut, that are in the body, that are in the system. So what role like, is the healthy microbiome? I mean, we spoke about it very generally in the infections part when things are overgrowing. And so within this and the, the things that are going on, what role does this really have to play? Is the, Can it get out of hand? Can the microbiome be deficient in allowing things? Or what's really going on here when we speak microbiome and we're really talking about infections? Well, microbiome is a fairly new concept that's not really, I mean, it's proven to exist, but I would say it's not really proven to be essential um, in us. So obviously it is essential in herbivores. That's why I gave that discussion earlier about human evolution and all the rest of it. So um, a microbiome is absolutely essential in herbivore. You absolutely need that large, large intestine, the large cecum, to ferment for a significant period of time sufficiently the cellulose, the fiber, into the short-chain fatty acids, which then provides you fuel to fuel your mitochondria, to give you energy to live, right? In the human organism, it's not as proven about the benefit. Um, the best defense that I can give is, you know, that certain organisms do help us help produce certain nutrients for us like butyrate which we um touched on earlier uh but that's mainly like a fuel for the cells of the large intestine itself uh but it helps to cleanse the liver and it has a bunch of other functions you know they create uh b12 they create k2 although it is possible to get those externally it's even possible to get butyrate externally it's uh, in butter and dairy specifically and you can also supplement it so it's something that seems to help us. And of course, you know, we don't live a sterile life. And so we are going to have sometimes bad pathogenic organisms come in. And so if they come into an environment where there are, you know, beneficial organisms that are going to, you know, resist them from colonizing, that is a good thing. But people have such radically different microbiomes depending on their diet. Um, and it's not really proven that basically there are people walking around with radically different microbiomes who feel great. And there are also people walking around with very similar microbiomes where one of them feels great and one of them feels terrible. So the research on it is still early. As I say, there are some experts um, who believe that we'd be better off if we just didn't have any of those organisms. Because even most of the ones that are considered commensal, so that's the vast majority, they're like supposed to be neutral, they're still creating toxins. They're still creating neurotransmitters that are affecting how we think and feel. They're still creating, you know, serotonin and acetylcholine and noradrenaline and histamine and all the rest of it. Um, the vast majority of which are not really helping us. So it, it, even if the thing itself is not bad, like they're creating such an excessive amount that it's it's just messing with 
you know, our natural how we feel. So I don't think there's any easy answers to this. As I said, we're, you know, from the religious perspective, it's like maybe, you know, God created us recently as perfect beings in the Garden of Eden and then, you know, something went wrong and, and now here we are. But from the scientific perspective, it's like we were one kind of animal that, you know, was adapted to thrive in one kind of terrain with a specific diet and a specific digestive system. And then it seems like we radically changed. So we went from herbivore to almost carnivore to then omnivore. And then, uh, you know, then we adapted to eating grains in about 10,000 years ago, which again was a complete change from before when we were maybe more hunter gatherers. And, and now again, in the last hundred years, our diet has completely changed again. And we're trying to adapt to that. And so, the idea that there is one way that we're just supposed to be that's just perfect, I think is more of a religious idea than an idea that's based on any kind of science um, and, you know, evidence. And I'm not dismissing religions. I am, I consider myself, you know, a religious person, but, you know, that's not what this podcast is about. Um, this is, you know, we're, we're about facts and evidence here, not, not you know, speculation uh, and faith. And so... Yeah, I think uh, the microbiome and what it should be like and is it good and all that is still open to um, open to investigation. I don't think it's proven. Okay. Yeah. No, that's a very good point. So more investigation on that topic. And finally, I know we're um, this has been so educational. Um, so one last question for me on this part of just really, you know, stress. And how that impacts these chronic infections. And could it, you know, if somebody's um, finding that they have had a very stressful experience, would that potentially impact these chronic infections and bring them on and make them worse? Massively, yeah. That's why, you know, right at the start, I said about um, the level of vitality of the body, which I put down to temperature. And I said the things that control that are thyroid and adrenals. So when the stress, the adrenaline will go up, but it will also go down. There will be this roller coaster. When that happens, um, less of that conversion from T4 to T3 takes place, more the conversion from T4 to reverse T3. The person's metabolism will start to go down unless they're in the peak of stress. Um, they're going to have less vitality. And of course, you know, that's the most, what's the word, core issue, but they're all the peripheral issues, right? You're not going to sleep as well. You're not going to, your digestion slows down. Um, you know, you create less stomach acid, you create less bile, the uh, intestinal mobility, motility, which we didn't really talk about much, but, you know, that slows down. Um, the immune system doesn't work as well if, uh, if the thyroid's function is down and if the cortisol is up. The blood sugar is affected, right? If the adrenaline is going up and down, then the levels of uh, blood sugar to insulin are going up and down and imbalanced and all the rest of it. So, I mean, I could go on, on but fundamentally, the, the concept that I like to kind of hang it all around is coherence, which, you know, we see in the heart rate variability, which interestingly seems to be one of the main ways that they measure stress these days, people with their Apple watches and aura rings and all the rest of it. Um, I think it's a good measure because it is measuring that level of uh, coherence, at least in one area, in you know, an important area in the heart. And so when the coherence goes down, it means everything is out of balance, right? Sometimes it's too high, sometimes it's too low. More commonly, it's going back and forth between being too high and too low. You know, your temperature going up and down when it shouldn't be, and your blood sugar is going up and down when it shouldn't be, and... You know, the, the amount of stomach acid production is going up and down when it shouldn't be, and the level of cytokines is going up and down when it shouldn't be, and it just goes on and on and on. Like, things are no longer stable and balanced and harmonious and coherent. Um, so that's more the big picture issue. So to get back to coherence, to get back to a good high rate of heart rate variability, a good stable 37 or 98.6-inch temperature, these are kind of easily quickly measurable things that pretty much anyone can do to, to see whether they're in that coherent state or not. And if you're not, that's kind of the goal. That's what you want to get back to. And I relate that, you know, I used to talk years about, I used to talk a lot more from a TCM kind of a, a Chinese medicine point of view. And I relate those very firmly to uh, what they call uh, Shen and Qi in those systems. 
So for qi, I want to see that temperature. I want to see that vitality. I want to see that 37 or 98.6. For shen, I want to see that coherence. I want to see that heart rate variability. Um, and then for jing, I, I want to see, you know, hormonal balance. I want to see, um, you know, cortisol and testosterone and progesterone and all that imbalance. Those are like the fundamental markers that I want to look for to see. And they are the first thing to get disrupted when a person is that in that stress state, as you say, and the things I want to get back in balance. And that's why, you know, I always start with that. I always start with terrain. Except for if it's an emergency. But if it's an emergency, it's none of my business. Then it's a doctor. But once you've dealt with the emergency and you're back to, okay, how do I resolve things long term? Then we want to get, you know, we want to get a person back into balance with those kind of essential areas and then do all the kind of stuff we've talked about in this episode. Like, right, okay, is there an infection? How, what are we going to do about it? Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. This has been so educational, Elwin. So educational and very in depth. So thank you for that. And before we finish now, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I would strongly recommend uh, testing and asking for help. Preferably both, but at least one. If you, you know, I know, know some people who just absolutely they can't bear to ask anyone for help, or they can't bear doctors, or they can't bear, you know, they only want to see a GP and not any of those hippie functional medicine doctors or whatever it might be who would actually help them with this kind of thing. You know, wh whatever your issue is, at least do something. If you're if you absolutely refuse to see anyone, or you can't afford to see anyone, or whatever it may be, then at least test. Don't guess with this stuff, right? Do the kind of testing that we've talked about in, you know, all these episodes. But, you know, today, do um, do your uh, stomach acid test, do an H. pylori test. We didn't talk about that, but that's something you can easily do with a, a stool test. You can do, you can, you know, pay $100 for a doctor to do it, but you can also order like $2 tests off Amazon for like either stool or blood test for H. pylori. You can test for SIBO, and we talked about that. You can test for... We didn't talk about testing for um, candida, but it's the same thing, uh, stool test for uh, uh, fungus. Uh, doing like a, a very comprehensive, if you can afford it, GI effects or GI map, or at the very least, doing like a stool pathogens test, which would be maybe $100 instead of maybe $400 for the full test. Because um, it may not be an infection. So there's no point treating an infection you don't have. And there's also no point treating an infection with something that won't work for it. So I only started to make progress with this when I tested, found out what I actually had, and then looked to see what actually helps with that specific infection. Now, if this is your first dipping your toe into it, then maybe just having some garlic or some oregano oil or some mastic or whatever is all you need, fine. But I'm saying if you've really tried a few basic things and it hasn't helped or it's made it worse, then I would strongly recommend don't spend, you know, whatever limited resource you have all on supplements or herbs or treatments or whatever, testing, either ideally with a professional or at least, you know, self-directed testing is uh, really a key to success when it comes to this stuff. Beautiful. Thank you, Alan. And thank you for those who stayed to the end. <laughs> we value you. We appreciate you. And let us know in the comments if you have any questions or, you know, just even if you enjoyed the episode, we'd love to hear from you. And please make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button and that bell icon so you don't miss the next episode. And we'll see you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode. And one of the ones I'd recommend is just here if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below if you want to click on that one and watch that next.